And good morning. It is a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. I'm Glenn Clark, and like most of my voice, no, not even most. I'd say like, well, I guess technically anything above 50 50 is most. So I guess I get to say it's most of my voice, a good bit of my voice. Certainly not all of it. It's going to be a battle. Uh, you, were, you were screaming. I wish that was the case. Finish his story. I didn't do that. Didn't do that even a little bit. Wouldn't have done that even if I had a voice. No, it's the uh, it's the totality of all of the work that I have done over the course of the last three weeks where I've been working like three jobs a day. To be clear, I'm grateful, appreciative. Good for business. Speaking of pro wrestling, but not great for... Remembering you don't have an off day. There's no like, oh, today I'll rest my voice. Not an option. Not the way it's going to go. Just admit it was at WrestleMania. That's why I you wish, lost your voice. I wish I could tell you it was, man. I wasn't able to like, I think at one point my buddy was like, wow, you're awfully quiet. I'm like, yeah, dude. I don't have a voice. Is gone. I don't even know what I would have made a lot of noise for last night. Bobby Lashley. I love Bobby Lashley. All in on Bobby Lashley. I would have been like Logan if, Paul, I guess. If I was, yeah, Logan Paul. If I had been there on uh, Saturday, I would have lost it for our truth because he's the greatest professional wrestler in the history of professional wrestling. Really, he's the greatest. No one better than our truth. Okay. Um, yesterday, uh, Damian Priest. That's not true. Damian Priest cashing in, and I, and I was still like, <laughs> at one point, I thought about yelling, and then I was like, it's not there. <laughs> like, it. it's just not there. I was clapping. I did get up. And oh, you got clapped? That's yeah, nice. I did, That's I did nice. give him that. It's brutal, man. It really is brutal when uh, you do this for a living. And like you just and, and honestly, everything was fine until the casino Saturday night. I started to notice it. I'm like, ooh, not great. And I was like, oh, I got a radio show to do tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, speaking of which, I'm going to be back in uh, the, the sports social at Live Casino and Hotel tonight. I'll be there for the championship game. Hope you'll come join us. Watch Connecticut. Try to make it back to back. See what uh, the Boilermakers can do against them. We're going to be hanging out, trying to help you win some money. We got great giveaways. We had an awesome atmosphere on Saturday night. It was raucous. Everybody was. Um, I don't know, a little bit bummed because there were a lot of NC State supporters in the room on Saturday night. Like when the room, well, I, and it was weird too because it was like North Carolina people that told me they were North Carolina fans, but they were rooting for NC State. I'm like, wow. I don't know that I would be doing that. Like that's that's kind of crazy. Then somebody said to me, I, one of the people that I was talking to on Saturday night was like, "What if it was Northwestern?" I was like, "That's interesting." Like I, I hadn't. They they would be in every way an underdog and a Cinderella story, and that would be cool. But I'm like, it's still like Maryland. Maryland's in the Big Ten, but they're not really in the Big Ten. Like you guys have been quote unquote rivals for decades, decades. But a lot of NC State support, so that was a bummer because that game was just flat. Like just never really even got going. It was the. It was tough. It was tough. But then um, great atmosphere for the second game as well. We just had a great time. And we're back there tonight. So come join me at Sports and Social this evening for the title game, which for reasons doesn't start until after 9 o'clock on a Monday night, which I know we deal with this every year. We get back to this every year. And every year we're required to say the same things. Hey, they watch basketball on the West Coast too. Fine. Maybe 8.45 at, like, the latest. That gives people time to get out of work on the West Coast and get to the game at 5.45. I understand the game is in Arizona. And so the game will be tipping off at 6.20 local time. And I get that you want people to be able to get to the game. I understand that. It's also the national championship game. I'd like to think people will be willing to alter their plans just a little bit. Did, did did folks uh, if correct me if I'm wrong? The World Series happened in Arizona last year. Uh, correct. That is correct. correct. Yes. Lynn. Did you notice like large swaths of empty seats because the game started at five o'clock local time? Because I I gotta be honest with you, I did not notice that. 
it looked to me like everyone was able to get to the games on time despite the fact that they started at 5 o'clock. Like maybe people were willing to alter their schedules in order to get to the games. Just a thought. Now, having lived there, I also know that Glendale is an ever-loving nightmare. Like, it's the worst place ever. And not just because of the meth. The meth is prevalent. But it's awful because it's, like, separated from everything. Unless you happen to live in Glendale, it is horrendous for trying to get there. And traffic in Phoenix is... It's not D.C. bad, but it's abysmal for some reason. Now, this, of course, in fairness, I, I lived there a decade and a half ago. Maybe it's improved because they in, in put in a light rail system. I don't know. But it was, I mean, moribund when I was there. It's 9.20. 9.20. Really? It's a half an hour later than the, I mean, the game on Saturdays. I mean, there's been like three teams on the West Coast that have played in a championship game in like the last 20 years. It's not like those fan bases. <laughs> and my God, there was the Gonzaga, and then uh, the UCLA. Right? Man, would they make a title game or did they lose in this? They lost to Gonzaga in the semifinals. Never mind. They didn't even make the title yeah. game. Did or- Oregon made the title game against? Um, didn't they? Oregon made a title game, right? I'm not crazy. Um, they definitely made a final. Four. I know they made a final four. Did they make a title I don't game? I think they made a title game. That's the problem is that nobody. <laughs> Losing in the championship game Baylor, is like the least memorable I, I thing ever. They're not West Coast. They're yeah, Texas. I know, but they're you know west of the Mississippi. So. Yeah, but that's that's a one hour difference. <laughs> that's not that. It's a one hour difference there. I think I'm. I try to think if I'm even if I'm forgetting about someone else. Um. No, I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, the moral of the story is. Nine twenty tonight. Come hang out with us. Have a late night. You're good. Come have a late night with us. We'll hang out. We'll go to the coast. I don't know what I'm talking about. We're just UCLA was in it uh, 2006, and then Gonzaga lost to Baylor in 2021. 2006 that UCLA. Was the- that was Florida. Yes. Okay. All right. I don't even remember them being in that title game. I got. I'm. I remember nothing about that. It was in Indianapolis. Because Florida beat Ohio State the the next year, right? It was correct. UCLA then Ohio State. Just want to go down the line. Who won in 2008? No, I don't. I don't want to do this. I don't. I have no interest in this. Not at all. Who? Oh wait. All right. Hang on a second. Oh wait. Was oh eight Kansas? Uh, yes, it was. That was Mario Chalmers. Uh, yeah. Right. OT. Was that? Yeah, yeah. that was Mario. Chalmers. Yeah, that was Mario Chalmers. Yeah, that was Mario Chalmers. That was his heroics because uh, that was to Memphis, of course. It was. Over uh, Memphis. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, thank you. Uh, 2009. <laughs> 2009, I want to say Michigan State lost. That is correct. They did lose. Now, why did I know that and I can't come up with who won? Why is that the part that I'm having trouble with? Michigan State lost to Carolina, right? Yes. Yeah, Carolina. Uh, Hansborough and yeah. North 2010 Carolina. would have been Duke Butler, mm-hmm. oh, which means that 2011 would have been uh, Butler losing to, oh, God, was that Kentucky or was that UConn? Oh, uh, UConn, UConn, right? It was UConn. UConn. So then Kentucky won the next year. Kentucky won the next year over Kansas. Oh, what? I mean, thanks a lot, jerk. Oh, sorry, I thought... I'm sitting here trying to do this. Okay, sorry. My God. I mean, we Did started it? with you saying, no, we're not doing this. Yeah, right? but then I obviously started doing it, a-hole. All right, I won't say the next one. Clearly. We can skip tidbit today. Uh, I guess that would have been Louisville, Michigan? Uh, Not. Oh, yes, it was Michigan. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, what am I? Th- Louisville. Although this one doesn't Michigan. count, they got stripped. So. Right, that's right. It doesn't count. So then that would have been another UConn. That would have been the, yes. and that was UConn over Kentucky, right? It was. That was when they were seven and eight seeds, or what? I mean, it was bizarre tournament that year. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, where was, are we year wise? I twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen. So that was. I only know this because we brought it up the other night at the at the uh, sports oh, yeah. and social. That's Wisconsin losing to Duke mm-hmm. in twenty fifteen. And I was, I remember having that feeling of dread when Wisconsin, like everybody was excited about Wisconsin beating Kentucky because Kentucky was also thought of as kind of an evil empire at that point because there was a lot of questions about John Calipari's recruiting and whether or not he was breaking the rules. And that was, and then, um, yeah, as soon as they won, I was like, hey, and everybody was like, wow, this is incredible. I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but I got a bad feeling about what this means. 
Um, so then we're into the Villanova, right? Mm-hmm. So Villanova, oh, which one was first? Villanova, uh, Carolina was first, right? Because that was the Chris yes. Jenkins game. Yep. That was crazy. And then <laughs> they didn't win the following year, and then they won the year after that. So, because yeah, Car- Carolina came back and won the following year. Correct. That one was played in Phoenix. That was Gonzaga. It was. Yeah, that was Gonzaga. And then, right, Villanova, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Kyle and I got into a fight the next morning. Michigan because I, by 20. I started the show by saying um, something like, uh, Villanova beat Michigan last night. It was not competitive or something like that. And Kyle was l- pissed. He was like, like yes, li- it was. Livid. Like, like, because Kyle would also want to fight about anything. Like, that was just in his nature. Like, he just, he thought that was his role here was to just fight with me. And and that's like he well, he watched those types of shows growing up, like where that was the way that you went about doing content. And so like every time I said anything, but in particular things that he cared about, like Michigan. And so Michigan was not competitive. I mean, like to say they were not. I guess anyone's competitive. They didn't lose by fifty. Yeah, they lost by. But there was never a point 18, during that game where like there was a threat. 17. And in that way, it was. I think what I was trying to reflect is it was a bummer of a championship game. It was sort of like Purdue, NC State on Saturday night. Yeah. Like was were there moments where NC State was within three possessions and you were like, I don't know, maybe they can get a little run going. I guess. But were they competitive? No. No. And that was what that championship game was. But Kyle wasn't having it. He was, he was very angry. Um, so then we get Virginia, right? After they lost to UMBC, they come back and win the title. They beat uh, Texas Tech. They did. Remember some late controversy and regulation in that game. A a very controversial call when Texas Tech was up late in regulation, but Virginia ends up winning it. Was that DeAndre Hunter? And yes, yeah. that was DeAndre Hunter, 100%. So then you have uh, 2020, the pandemic. And yeah. then out of the so pan- it would have been Maryland, but right, yeah. yes, definitely would have been Maryland, as you could tell when they were falling apart down the stretch. Probably that Maryland season. over Dayton that year. Good. They were doing everything in their power to to piss that away. They were they had a, a outright Big Ten championship right in their grasps, and they were like, "Nah, we're good." Maybe they knew. Maybe they knew there was going to be a pandemic. Um, this is why we're we wasting our time. So then Baylor Gonzaga out yes. of the pandemic, and then uh, uh, last year was Kansas. Two years ago. Oh right, yeah, two years ago, yeah, Kansas, Carolina, because mm-hmm. then last year was uh, UConn, San Diego State. Yeah. A game that again wasn't really. Competitive. That was pretty good, man. That yeah, was well pretty done. good. Well done. Every I'm pretty All proud right, of now, myself. Uh, for that. Before nope. 2006. No, no, no. Actually, I'd probably do fairly well with those two. Honestly, like that's the goofy part. I mean, like I I was such a nerdy college basketball fan growing up. Like it was what I, I think because we didn't have the NFL. Um, college basketball was kind of like what carried me. Um, other than the Orioles, obviously, as a fan. So, um. I probably could do fairly well pre-2006, but I'm not going to do it because okay. we got other things to talk about. All right, all right. We got things to do. Like what happens to the bloodline? And Yeah, that's <laughs> what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to talk about. All right, uh, it is a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Today's show also brought to you by Atman's Deli in Harbor Point. So excited that there's a new Atman's. And it's awesome, and it's got a full bar, and even if, like, the baseball team's losing games, you're going to have a pretty pleasant time if you're watching them at the bar at Atman's and Harbor Point because you got all the delicious food that you know and love from the original Atman's, the deli sandwiches, the corned beef, the desserts, the soups, the hand-rolled bagels. they got that wonderful breakfast menu if you get there early enough, and you can watch all the games right there in their bar. I hear there's some golf tournament coming up this week. Somebody asked me if we're going to do another um, charity thing uh, for the golf tournament. I'm like, God, it's a burden. It's such a burden, man, to do all these things. i got to go through the day and figure out. I never, I never look through to make sure that there wasn't somebody that slipped through the cracks and didn't pay for the basketball uh, thing, so i got to spend time doing that today. Because we're down to Kelly Sanford and Jen Babish, one of the two of them. It's going to be a second straight year. We have a female winner of the bracket contest. So, ladies kicking ass. Um, maybe is my answer. Maybe. we got to figure out what the charity would be. Um, I feel like we did that for Drew's golf thing. Like, whatever his golf charity is. And I don't really know that I feel like supporting that. <laughs> 
drew a golf charity. I mean, it's probably not even real, right? Like, he just goes to his. Uh, his I, next, I mean, it's just got to be like his next know. round, <laughs> or or support it. Maybe it supports Calvert Hall. I don't know. Like I like them, but I don't know. We'll figure something out. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not promising anything as far as that's concerned. But base best place to watch would be at Atman's Harbor Point. Um. I feel like it's the same conversation, so I almost don't want to have it. We are defaulting to, and I didn't write today. I'll probably write for tomorrow at PressBoxOnline.com. And I will probably address, it feels like the topic du jour, although I think my buddy John Mioli, who's joining us later, wrote about it, so now I don't want to steal his thunder. I feel like the topic du jour, which is what I try to write about on Mondays, is the Orioles' offensive struggles juxtaposed with the absurdity of what's going on at Norfolk. And that won't go away until one of a few things happens. The Orioles start hitting. Norfolk stops hitting. The guys at Norfolk are Orioles. Like, one of those three things has to happen in order for that conversation to go away. It, it's such a complicated conversation. It's so, it's so difficult to, to bring it to a level where you can have a take. I end up finding myself, whenever the topic comes up, sort of never getting to a point where I'm like, well, here's what I think the Orioles should do. It's easy to have hindsight thoughts about it. The hindsight thought is, this is why they probably should have been more aggressive in the trade market in the offseason. Because you knew you had this much stockpiled and not all of them could play at the major league level. But as we talked about on Friday with Stan, one, they're in the midst of an ownership change that we just didn't know about. And two, it still requires you to try to predict the future. At which of these positions are we going to need and at which are we not? Who's definitely good? Did the Orioles have any idea at the end of last season that Kyle Stowers would be demanding his way back into the picture? That they should clear something out for Kyle Stowers? We would have laughed at the thought. So even as we say, in hindsight, they should have done this. In hindsight, they could have added another starting pitcher besides just Corbin Burns. Well, at the time, again, did they know what Kyle Bradish's situation was. So could they have? Of course. Absolutely they could have. As I said before, with all due respect to Dean Kramer, I, I would not have been working under the assumption that you had to hold a rotation spot for Dean Kramer. If you could have done better, do better. <laughs> Although yesterday, Dean Kramer did better. Dean Kramer was very good, obviously, yesterday. Um... I, it's easy to say, hey, they should have seen this coming, they should have done that. It's not, it would not have been as easy to be in their shoes and to say, here's, we're, we, and also what is available. It, it's the other tricky part of it too. If the trade market for Austin Hayes is next to nothing, or let's say that the one team that's interested in Austin Hayes is a team that you feel like you're going to be competing against to try to win the American League East. I don't even know who that would be for what it's worth. Let's say I don't think the Yankees would have needed Austin Hayes. I don't. I don't. You get what I'm saying? It. We say all of these things because they're easy to say brainlessly. They're not quite as easy to flush out and think through when it requires really deep thought. We acknowledge the difficulty of what's in front of the Orioles as far as these decisions are concerned. They're, they're, they're good right now. I get it. It doesn't feel that way because they've struggled offensively. They're, they're good. We know that. Teams go through slumps. The notion that all of these guys are going to continue to hit this level for the entirety of the season is bananas. 
it's compounded by, clearly, Gunnar Henderson throwing a ball away yesterday. I mean, yes, the offense doesn't change if the Orioles win that game. But if the Orioles win the game, they're sitting at 6-3. and three. They've won all three of the series that we played. Yo, 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 ho, a pirate's life for me. We're all... They were playing the I know. It doesn't... Whatever. We're all in a good mood. We are more disgusted by it because they lost a game and they lost a series and it's the first time they've lost a series and then you deal with the trend and then we're having... Like, that's the way that it goes. But I, I still keep coming back to today, what should happen? What should they do today? And I don't know the answer. Today, I, I would... St- I would continue to scream, today, either Connor Norby or Jackson Holiday should be here and playing second base. Now, for what it's worth, Jorge Mateo looked better defensively. Like, a lot better defensively at second base. I, you you got to call it like you see it. You know I don't think Jorge Mateo should be playing second base. But yesterday, both the, obviously, the relay throw was outstanding, and then the play up the middle, um, you know, was when he and Henderson had the back-to-back plays uh, up the middle. Tremendous. But the first answer I would have is you have a position available. There is a position to be had on the Major League Club. One of those guys should be here. Tony Kemp should enjoy watching the Eclipse from his home in Mesa, Arizona, or wherever. You know, like not. I'm not. I don't. I'm not trying to get his eyes to go out. I'm not trying to be mean to Tony Kemp. Like just go enjoy, bro. (laughs) Like have a day. Just probably not as a Baltimore Oriole. Um, That's the that's the one thing I could tell you. Hey, that's something that should happen immediately. Because that should have happened immediately two weeks ago. It's shameful that both of those guys are down there when there is a position to be had. It's embarrassing almost. It really, it it borderlines on malpractice with all due respect. And this is not, because we get into this area where like, how dare you, man, Mike Elias... You think you know more than Mike Elias? No, of course I don't know more than Mike Elias. But everyone makes mistakes. I I thought I knew that Jack Flaherty was a good trade. Turns out it was not. Although, of course, Jack Flaherty looks like he's a thing again this season. Son of a bitch. Not him, just in general. It's insane. Didn't he get roughed up in his last start? Did he? Yeah, his first start looked good, and then I think he got... What did he pitch yesterday? Is that is that what happened? Because I thought he was. I thought yeah. I thought I saw. I thought. All right, whatever. Maybe I saw it on Saturday. I um. Yeah, it's six runs uh, yesterday. All right, against against yesterday. Okay. Oh God. Or they never mind. I take it all back. Oh God. (laughs) You might as well. You might as well go watch the Eclipse with Tony Kemp today. (laughs) You're giving up six runs to Oakland. No disrespect. But y'all should probably just not. Six innings of one run ball against the White Sox. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a professional well, never, team. Never mind. <laughs> we think. Never mind. I take it back. We, we learned nothing about Jack Flaherty. He's, he's yet to face an actual team, and yet he's <laughs> already come. The wheels have come off. Take it all back. Like, it's okay to have these conversations. And the second base thing is teetering on malpractice. You have major league players playing at Norfolk that can play the position, and you are continuing to throw out guys that aren't major league second basemen. There's no no defending it. There's no this is acceptable. There's no any of that. It's a joke. It's honestly, it's laughable. And I don't, I don't want to go too far with this because at some point, like, it, it is unfair to Mike Elias, who has proven himself to be a, a plenty capable general manager. But, like, it almost demands a grilling. What was the thought process here? The other stuff I can't answer. I can't answer for the Heston, Heston Kirst out of it at all. I can't. I get it. Everything about what he's doing suggests he should be at the major league level. I agree. Now to do what? For Santander? No. 
You guys want to keep saying for somebody else, maybe for Hayes, for Mullins, you want to move on from that. I'm not doing it. This is nonsense. And with the idea that you assume, I think this is part of the absurdity of it too. It's almost like there's this assumption that if these guys were to be at the major league level, they would just definitively be able to replicate exactly what they're doing at Norfolk. Which is some galaxy brain stuff. Might they become that at some point? Yeah, it might very well be that Heston Kersight is a high-level major league power hitter. Do I think he would be that tomorrow if he played at Fenway Park? I mean, was he the first time he was up? It's a it's what makes the conversation so uncomfortable. Maybe Kobe Mayo is skyrocketing so far that like there's going to be he's just that good. He really is. The moment he shows up at the major league level, he's going to be that player. And it was interesting listening to Stan talk about it last week that at some point there might just not be a Jordan Westberg in the conversation. Now, it's still weird for me to think that Kobe Mayo is going to play third base. Like, I think we've all assumed that he's going to be a first baseman. But, like, you know, I don't know if you saw Ryan Mountcastle. He's looking pretty good this year. Yeah. So On both sides. So are you making him a DH? Were you making Kobe Mayo? That's what I mean. Is a code you making Kobe Mayo a DH? I, I'm not saying no. Like let's let's talk about it. It's a complicated conversations, bro. And and we just try to keep dumbing them down. Like look at everything at Norfolk. I'm like, right, I understand. But now you tell me what to do because outside of second base, I don't have the answer. And Heston Kerstad, to my knowledge, can't play second base. I don't think they've tried that. I don't think Kyle Stowers is a second baseman. And the way that we so casually say, well, just get rid of so-and-so, bro, it don't work that way. Like, you're playing fantasy GM and a level that, again, if the conversation is this is why you should have tried to trade Austin Hayes at the end of last year, one, we don't know that they didn't. Two... They they didn't successfully do it. Now what? Now what? And they just keep saying, move on, move on, move on. For what? To give away a capable, good baseball player in a season where you're trying to be good? For a bag of balls? Is that I mean, is that what we're suggesting? Just take anything that anyone will give them? The trade market says here you can have the some team's number 17th ranked prospect just get rid of Austin Hayes because you feel like Austin Hayes is now a problem because Kyle Stowers has to be here. You get, we got to – we're just saying things. I get it. It's frustrating. The Orioles lost two out of three games. It's kind of laughable that they scored four runs on Saturday because they were awful offensively on Saturday. Like, terrible offensively. And they somehow scored four runs. It's one of the weirdest. It's got to be the worst four-run performance I've ever seen in my life. Like, it was abysmal. All they needed was one more hit. One more, and they just never they never got an RBI hit, correct, on Saturday? It was all runs that scored. And, um, um, the, the sack fly counts as an RBI, right? No, I said hit. Oh, hit. RBI okay, said, hit. Yeah, yeah. They didn't get an RBI hit all day, correct? Um, I think you're going to be correct, yeah. They scored two runs yesterday. Words. Two. Dose. They scored in one inning. I get it. We're frustrated. And with every right. Should be frustrated. The pitching's been good. It was. It's also a huge bummer that Yanir can... Man, I was with... I, my, my buddy Brandon is a Pirates fan. Oh my god! And we were going to WrestleMania together, so we were like hanging out. And he, when when they were getting ready for the bottom of the ninth, he was like, "Wait, who's the Orioles closer?" And I was like, "Well, it's Kimbrel, but he's pitched the last two days, so I'm, it's going to be Cano today." And I said, "I swear to God," I said out loud. And honestly, given how he's pitched so far this season, I'm starting to think it might be Cano before the year is over. <laughs> womp, womp. That's a bummer. 
We're all worked up about it. And at some point, totality might cause the necessity of making bold moves. But not after nine games. I think the other part of the frustration is we looked at the schedule to start the season and said to ourselves, there's a real chance for the Orioles to, like, make hay. Not just to get off to a good start, to be like, to create some distance. And so far, that's not what they're doing. So maybe that makes it feel a little bit more panicked. Like, hey, you should be, this is the type of schedule that you should be 7-2 and against. That you should be stockpiling and building up, you know, some comfort, some cushion against this schedule. But again, it's a long baseball season. It's the equivalent of about one NFL game that has been played. They're not gonna, they're just not going to push a panic button and do something crazy. And it would be wild if that were the case. Still doesn't give them no forgiveness for the second base thing. Like, one of these cats should be here. Real quick, we didn't get a chance to do it, obviously. I was really looking forward to coming in here and having, I, I had a plan that on the weekend, if they win more than one game, we put all of them ah, in order. Gotcha. I had a plan for it. On Saturday, I was so ready to make Danny Coulomb the man of the match. I was imagining it would be Grayson, Coulomb, and then I don't know who it would have been Dean yesterday. yesterday. I guess Dean yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it had to been. I wanted it to be Mateo. If you could have made that play, I guess maybe Gunner would have had it. Maybe. Maybe. I, mean, I wanted it to be Mateo because he made a couple of nice defensive plays, and I was like, man, this is a good – it probably won't be more Jorge Mateo ever again. A lot of guys made some good defensive plays uh, up until the very last one. All right. Well, love you, James McCann, but you're going up top. I'm sorry, I should still talk into the microphone. Love you, James McCann, <laughs> but you got to go up top. Grayson's back. Down. All right. He's the only no offense. The only man of the match we had this weekend. No offense to Grayson, but hopefully he's not there long. Yeah, well, they don't play today, so. Yeah. Well, okay, so by Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I hope there's a new one come Wednesday morning. <laughs> what tape did we use for this? Um, I don't know which tape did we use on him. This is a mess. All right, I'll, uh, yeah. We'll, we got to come up with we'll keep, pins. We we'll, got to we we'll get a better yeah, system. Yeah, we'll keep working on it. <laughs> up with a better option. Yeah, let's come up with a better option. For Put it to the top. Man of the match. But there you go. Grayson was the last man of the match on Friday, so he retakes the spot today. Uh, don't forget, we want your three up and three down. We'll get to that a little bit later on in the program. For the last seven days specifically, so the six games the Orioles played, the three this weekend against the Pirates, the three um, last week against the Royals, that window Three Orioles up, three Orioles down. I, I'm not good at this. I'm, reminder, I would like you to rank them. That's what Griffin and I are doing. I keep forgetting to tell everybody that, but, you know, like I guess life will go on. Probably won't be the end of the world. I mean, I don't know. Maybe the apocalypse will happen when the sun and the moon collide today. But uh, get me your three up and three down for the I Orioles during the course. What? I hope not. I mean, I hope not. Yeah. But I like, guess I don't know. What would matter? I mean, really, what's going on here? <laughs> really? Have you been paying attention to how things have been going recently? Jeez. I got a 15 cent discount on gas and it cost me 350. I'm like, Jesus Christ. It's that bad. Huh? I guess I guess the guy the, the folks in the White House really don't want to keep their job. <laughs> like they really want the other guy to win because they just keep doing this bit where they're like, "Eh, gas prices, eh, whatever. Nobody like, bro. We feel about as good as we do as people uh, based on how much we're paying for gas." Like, get a hold of it. Ah, it's, ah, it's not something we're worried about. Yo, I, I mean, I don't know how to tell you how to do your jobs. Far be it from me. Not that guy, but just couldn't help but notice. All right, uh, we'll get the three up and three down a little bit later on in the program. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, we will preview the championship tonight. Talk a little bit about the – there is a, obviously a huge local connection in the title game tonight is Boys Latin Zone Cam Spencer – the pride of Davidsonville and UConn try to make it back-to-back -back titles. Dan Bonner 
Of course, uh, it works for everybody, but most notably CBS and Turner during the course of the tournament. So we'll catch up with Dan Bonner to get his thoughts on uh, Cam Spencer and UConn in the matchup with Purdue this evening. That's on the way. It is a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Hey, it's Jeremy Kahn. This postseason, bet in person at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks with locations in Canton and in Towson and enjoy the best in-class sports wagering experience at their state-of-the-art facilities, bringing an unmatched sports betting thrill. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub, sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden, or take a tour of our brewery. (laughs) Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan-favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. Make the most out of every day in your Toyota RAV4. Available in hybrid or gas-only models. A RAV4 can get you where you want to go in style. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new RAV4s from your local Toyota dealer today. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money. I love you more every day. Well then, don't get a speeding ticket this trip, okay? Sign up for Rofo Rewards and upgrade to Rofo Pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria. A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. Two dollars of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. One of the things that's definitely wrong with this country is that this dude still has a job somehow, some way. Glenn Clark. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Monday edition of the program. Don't forget for all of the latest in high school sports news here in the state of Maryland, countysports.zone is the place to turn. Scores, schedules, rankings, pick them, everything you need to know for baseball, softball, boys and girls lacrosse. You can find it at County Found it. You can find it at countysports.zone, which is proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer, and buyatoyota.com. We continue along here on a Monday edition of GCR. Congratulations to the South Carolina women's basketball team, national champions, finish an undefeated season. It was always their title to win. It's not surprising in any way that they were able to be victorious, uh, give Iowa credit. Man, they they battled. Like, I I, I know that that's going to sound backhanded because I think everybody was rooting for Caitlin Clark and feeling like it was hers, her moment. But I think South Carolina was notably better than Iowa, and yet Iowa was right there within a couple of scores 
in the final couple of minutes of the game. Like, they battled like hell and ultimately came up short. It is, it's disappointing for Caitlin Clark, one of the great players in the history of the game, to have gone to back-to-back title games and not come away with a championship. It, it does not take away from the brilliance of her career. Um, and Dawn Staley in that program right now, they are, the way that we viewed UConn for years, as there's one program that it was separated, that's what UConn, or that's what South Carolina kind of is at the moment. I get it. They didn't win the title a year ago, but back-to-back undefeated regular seasons, national champions this year, they've separated themselves a little bit from everybody else. Congratulations, South Carolina. Hell of a game. Hell of a game yesterday. Men's National Championship is tonight out in Phoenix. And joining us now, of course, an analyst for CBS and Turner Sports during the NCAA tournament. It's always a pleasure to welcome back to the program Coach Dan Bonner, who's with us now here on GCR. Dan, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's always great to catch up with you. Thank you so much for taking the time for us this morning. Well, Glenn, it's always nice to talk to you, and I appreciate the invitation. I hope things are going well. Everything's going well except for, um, you know, Maryland basketball fans didn't have the most pleasant of year, Dan. <laughs> like, other than that, everything is going well. And the Orioles lost yesterday. But other than that, everything is going well. Dan, um, I, I want to start with a local connection to tonight's game because Cam Spencer is an incredible story. Um, someone who was completely overlooked coming out of Boys Latin here in Baltimore ended up at Loyola locally and putting up big numbers and grinding and getting the chance to go play at Rutgers. I I don't know. And and if I remember correctly, he was sort of like the backup plan for UConn in the transfer portal because they really wanted Nick Timberlake who ended up at, at Kansas. What Cam Spencer has done and how good he's proven to be at this level for this UConn team, was there any possible way to see this coming? I don't think so, although I think that the UConn coaches, Glenn, certainly thought that there were some possibilities or they wouldn't have gone after him. These guys clearly really know how to evaluate talent. And just because he wasn't their first choice doesn't mean he wasn't an important choice. Sure. But he has he has blended in so well. Uh, he's very – I mean, come on now. He's, he's a tremendous offensive rebound. <laughs> you know, he passes the ball so well. Yep. He's constantly moving on offense. He just fits into what they are doing perfectly. And in addition, of course, yeah, he can shoot the ball. So, uh, you know, he is a perfect fit for that team. And it's a team, I I think, of perfect fits all around. You know, it's funny you say that because, like, UConn, I give so much credit, obviously, to Dan Hurley, but not just Dan Hurley, his entire staff. It's not a player. It's, It's not even a player or two. It is a deep team. It is a team that always seems prepared for everything that gets thrown at them. Like, Dan, I, I thought that Alabama did about as good of a job as anyone can do against UConn, and yet they still won that game somewhat comfortably in the end. Like, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me. How do you explain this sort of machine that UConn has become where it's not about the greatness of one particular player? Uh, you know, uh, again, th- th- that's something that if you could put your finger on it, let's say if you were a coach and you could put your finger on that, then you you would punch your ticket to the Hall of Fame because you would win all the time. And it's just one of those things that happens. You get the perfect blend. And it's really amazing to me because I had UConn in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight last year. Yeah. And I thought, wow, you know, they're, you know this is a pretty good team, but they're going to lose guys. And they did. They lost four of their top guys. Three of the guys went to the pros. And I'm telling you something, Glenn, this UConn team is better this year than they were last year. Wow. Uh, there's just no question in my mind about that. And I think Spencer is one of the big reasons. Another reason is the freshman, Stefan Castle. Uh, I mean, good heavens. This guy is, uh, you know, he's, he is one of the top point guards. He'd be one of the top point guards on every, anybody's team. And yet he's only number three on that team in assists. And I'll tell you about that team, and speaking of assists, that Tristan Newton has well over 200 assists. He may be over 250 now. Uh, Cam Spencer has, you know, the last time I looked at their stats, he had 130 assists. So he's got more than that now. And Castle and Diara each had in excess of 90 assists. So you've got four guys on that team 
with 90 plus assists. And on the season, they have they are plus 350 against their opponents in assists. As a team, they have 350 more assists than their opponents. I've been doing this a long time. I've never seen a number like that. That is that is staggering, man. And I, again, I, I keep thinking it speaks to coaching. So I. I think one of the breakouts of this tournament, obviously, has been Donovan Klingon, coach. And I, I wonder, going into tonight, because then we're going to talk more about Zach Eady, but c- can UConn have enough trust to say the plan for tonight is we think that Donovan Klingon can at least battle Zach Eady, enough so that we don't have to constantly give extra attention on every possession? Can they go into this game believing, not that he's going to shut him down, because, of course, that's not going to happen against anyone, but that he can do enough that it doesn't require you taking attention away from anyone else? Well, I I definitely think they feel that way. And, you know, Klingon, he's a guy who was hurt early in the year. And so that's why if you look at his minutes played, his minutes played, you know, when I did him, and again, it was in this year's Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. He was only averaging 22 minutes a game. Now, he's played more than that in the NCAA tournament. But, yes, they trust him completely. Uh, yes, Zach Eady will be a little bit of a, an issue that he has never faced before. But the same is true of Zach Eady. He's never played against anybody like Klingon before. Uh, and if Klingon, you know, has struggled, Then they bring Samson Johnson off the bench. And Samson Johnson, he's not as big as Klingon, but he's 6 feet 11, and he's very athletic. And so UConn just has a number of different pieces that they can throw at you. And the other thing, Glenn, I would say, I don't know that you want your guy to play one-on-one against Zach Eady, no matter who you are. Sure. I think you want your guy to stay between Eady and the basket. I think you want him to make Eady shoot that jump hook as opposed to dunks and layups. But Edie, sometimes he struggles a little bit to handle the ball. Uh, and I'm, I'm not criticizing Zach Edie. I mean, good heavens. He's, right, right. <laughs> he's broke David Robinson's record for the most 2010 double-doubles in the NCAA tournament. But he is susceptible to turning it over if you surprise him. And so I think that you need to do that. Uh, and the other thing I think with Purdue is if somebody's going to beat you, you know, maybe see if the other guys are going to take some shots early in the game. Because Purdue, you wonder what their confidence will be like if they miss their first couple of threes. Dan Bonner is with us here on Glenn Clark Radio. We're getting ready for the title game tonight, Purdue and UConn. Dan, what you're saying, like obviously on Saturday, that wasn't the case. Braden Smith did not have a good game. It's just that NC State never got going, and so it didn't really kind of matter. I I, I think the, the dumbest thing I can say, but probably true is that it's going to require a much better performance from Braden Smith and some of the, the other guys on that team in order to beat UConn tonight. I don't think there's any question about that, Glenn. That's not a dumb thing to say at all. (laughs) I think, and I have said this all along, if you're going to an interview after their game, that this is the matchup that everybody wants because for the last two years, UConn and Purdue have been the two best teams. And I agree with that, you know, despite, produce upset this is what everybody wants to see they're the two best teams but even though that's the case purdue has to play it's a plus maybe it's a plus plus game and uconn has to be off a little bit or uconn wins that game uh i just think uconn's that good my buddy stan van gundy said a couple of times during the tournament that anybody in the NCAA tournament field if they were going to play uconn in a four-game series UConn would, uh, in a seven-game series, excuse me, like they do in the NBA, UConn would win that series without any doubt. Yeah. But Stan further felt that there's no other team in the tournament that could win even more than one game of, of that kind of a series against UConn. And I agree with that. But the beauty of college basketball is you don't have to win a seven-game series. You have to win one game. So what is the roadmap then? Like what is the if, – if Purdue is going to end the Big Ten's drought, which you know we we like to chuckle here because the last the last time a Big Ten team won the tournament was Maryland. It's just that they weren't a Big Ten team at that point. Um, <laughs> if if this two plus decade drought is going to end for the Big Ten tonight, what is the roadmap for how Purdue does this? 
Well, obviously, uh, you can't get Edie in foul trouble, and you have to have a big game from Edie. You know, 25 and 15 is not outside the realm of possibility or uh, necessity to me. Uh, Braden Smith has to be outstanding. I, I mean, he can't turn the ball over. He can't have two over and back violations. You know, he can't look like the moment is way too big for him, like it did the other day. Fletcher Lawyer has to score in a high volume. I mean, when Purdue was dominating everybody early in the season, Fletcher Lawyer had 27 in a win against Alabama, and he had 27 in a win against Tennessee. Lawyer has to score. Lawyer has to shoot the ball. And they have to be able to defend. Uh, You know, Lance Jones has really helped them defensively. But UConn just keeps coming at you. They keep running around. They keep (laughs) cutting to the basket. (laughs) They keep setting ball screens. They never stop. And so you have to be able to defend. And then, again, UConn is a tremendous offensive rebounding team. You have to take that part of the game completely away. Uh, And I know Castle made a couple of big threes the other day. But I think you have to you, you have to make sure that if Castle's going to beat you, he's going to beat you from three. Uh, and then you have to hope that maybe UConn doesn't shoot the three so well. And they didn't. They haven't at times in this tournament, but nobody's been able to take advantage of it. So, I, you know, if, if they don't, right? Like, it's funny because I was just talking about this with Caitlin Clark. If they don't, what is Zach Eady's story? Like, how do we – it's such a complicated thing, Dan. Like, I – I, I think Zach Eady's going to be an NBA player. I think he's going to have a nice career. I don't know that Zach Eady's ever going to be a superstar in the league just because of the way the game has changed. But as far as his legacy is, what is Zach Eady's legacy if they don't win the title tonight? Well, you know, I think his legacy, uh, he's, he's in a very exclusive club. Uh, I mean, there's only a few guys uh, who have won back-to-back National Player of the Year award. Uh, it's a very exclusive list. It's Jerry Lucas. It's Bill Walton. Uh, it's uh, David Thompson. It's Ralph Sampson. That's the list. And now there's Zach Eady. So, and you mentioned those guys. Those are some of the people say, wow, that's a, those are great players in college basketball history. And whether he has success in the NBA or not, Zach Eady is going to be one of the best players in the history of college basketball. And his story is utterly amazing because he didn't even start playing basketball until he was in the seventh grade. Uh, And when he came to Purdue, uh, the Purdue guys tell stories about the first time they saw him play. They thought, good heavens, what is this guy doing here? And he has made himself a tremendous basketball player. He's he's a tremendous basketball player, not just because he's so tall, but he's really well conditioned. He's really tough. He's really got a great mindset. Uh, You know, he'll I sat and talked with him after their game against Grambling in the first round. And he, it was, he came in after practice, and so he had his practice jersey on. And he looked like he had been in a battle against the Army of Cats. That's how many scratches he had all over his arms. So, mm. And he doesn't react to that kind of thing. He's under control, and he's, he's been a great college basketball player. He doesn't have to win a national championship to have that mantle. Ralph Sampson never won a national championship. Uh, But so I I just, you know, he's a tremendous player. I'm really fascinated to see what he does tonight against Klingon. I'm just, I look forward to that. It's like the old days. Uh, It's like Ralph Sampson and Patrick Ewing. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like basketball the way it used to be. It is, it is very old school. And I don't know, I kind of dig it, to be honest with you, Dan. Like, I don't, I I grew up watching great big men, so I've kind of missed that era, it's it's sort of like as a football fan, I, I miss the era where running backs mattered. I kind of miss the era where, like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal mattered, and I just don't feel like we're going to see players like that again, so I've kind of enjoyed it. Um, Dan, before I let you go, if I could, um, we, we mentioned at the top, obviously it was a difficult season for Maryland. They have seemed to have a pretty good offseason. They, they land Derek Queen, a, a five-star prospect. Juju Reese decides to come back for another year. Jacoby Gillespie, who a lot of people were after from Belmont, comes in. It was disappointing, but like it wasn't like they were they were they were hopeless. They played great defense throughout the course of the season. The offense was just really bad. Where would your faith level be that Kevin Willard can get things back on track during the course of just one season to get things turned around next year? I, you know, my my confidence level is very high. I think Kevin Willard is an outstanding coach, but. I mean, and we, we always talk about coaching, 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 and coaching 
matters. It's very important. But as Steve Kerr has constantly said, the first thing you need as a coach is you need talent. You need players. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are as a coach or how smart you are as a coach. You have to have players. And so the way teams are built in this day and age is not just with high school recruiting, which is, of course, as we all know, a hit and miss proposition, but is getting into that portal and finding people. You know, we've talked before about Cam Spencer. You know, UConn hit a home run with Cam Spencer. And you look just a little further south to Virginia. I mean, it's not like they had a bad season. They won 23 games this year, finished third in the ACC. But you have to say that their venture into the portal, the guys that got out of the portal were simply bust. And so as a result, they had a hard time scoring. So I have total confidence in Kevin's, Kevin Willard's ability to scout talent, to find talent, to coach talent, but then the talent has to produce. And so we're in that kind of an era now. Nobody knows what kind of a team you're going to have from one year to the next. And it's got to be very challenging for coaches. Yeah. I don't know why any of them have any hair. <laughs> that is a fair point. Uh, Dan Bonner, always appreciate you, man. Thank you for taking the time for us this morning, as always. Enjoy the game tonight, and let's chat again real soon, all right? Thank you, Glenn. You too. Dan Bonner with us here on GCR. Appreciate you taking the time. Yes, as um, John and Little Rock points out, the other uh, news this morning, kind of stunning in college basketball. Uh, you wake up and John Calipari, who, you know, there was a lot of heat on at Kentucky, but had that insane buyout that made, remember we talked to Josh Pastner a couple weeks ago, he was like, dude, John Calipari's not going anywhere. He's not giving up on that money. And we can all say Kentucky's got all the money in the world, but to, what was the total, like twenty three million dollars something like that like they they don't they're not paying that to someone who's not coaching so kind of a perfect storm John Calipari ends up taking the job at Arkansas now the people that are willing to do John Calipari's bidding for him are in the media are saying things like, well, you don't understand. John Calipari's always, re- you know, revered the Arkansas job. I think Arkansas is a very good job. Really do. But s- stop with that. John Calipari didn't leave Kentucky because Arkansas is a better place to be than Kentucky. John Calipari is leaving Kentucky because the heat was on at Kentucky and it was kind of no win at this point for him. John Calipari is leaving Kentucky because he saw an exit ramp. That doesn't mean he won't succeed at Arkansas. Eric Musselman succeeded a great deal at Arkansas. It's a program, much like Maryland, that has history. Corliss Williamson, Scotty Thurman, national champions under Nolan Richardson. Like, You can tap into that. That's not that long ago. That's not going back to the 70s. It's going back to the 90s. It's going back even further than Maryland, which feels like it was an eternity ago. But you can tap into that as the head coach at Arkansas. And I think John Calipari will be a a very good head coach at Arkansas because John Calipari is a very good head coach. Whatever your opinion is of him, he's a hell of a coach. Um... This is an escape for him. This is a chance to get out and go somewhere where it's fresh and exciting and you won't face the same burdens of expectations that, frankly, you created. It's not just that you created. It's Kentucky basketball. Whoever the coach is going to be there, that's going to be the burden. That That's what you deal with when you're the coach at Kentucky, even if you're not John Calipari. Um. If I'm an Arkansas fan, I'm excited. And I have every right to be excited. If I'm a Kentucky fan, I don't know, in a weird way, it might be a bit of a sigh of relief where it just felt like it was getting stale. But it's just hilarious to me, these guys that are willing to do the bidding of like, no, John Calipari always, he's always revered. Boy, that opportunity at Arkansas, when when an Arkansas, dude, you're the coach at Kentucky. Stop. 
You're the coach at a place where basketball is 1, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. And in the Southeast, it's the only job like that. Basketball matters at Arkansas, but not not the way it does at Kentucky. There are resources, but not like the resources they have at Kentucky. It is, it's a big story, but it's also obvious to kind of see this happened to work out for him. Then he said, huh. And maybe it's interesting that, like, I don't know if some of these other, I, I wonder if USC bothered to call. Before they hired Musselman, right? Like, I wonder if any of these other schools checked in to say, hey, man, no, there's a little heat there. What do you think? And perhaps, if you want to feel good as an art, like, maybe John Calipari would have said no to some of those other places. Would have said, like, I don't know that he would have raced to take the SMU job. Just because it's in the ACC now. I don't know. But... Um, it's kind of crazy. It is kind of crazy. All right, hour number one of today's show is in the books. The first hour of the program was brought to you by Ruth's Chris. Whether you're celebrating a milestone, entertaining clients, or really just enjoying a well-deserved night out, like a date night, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver to you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made them one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at Ruth's Chris. Dot com. Into our number two of the program today, and we'll get back into some Orioles conversation. Orioles dropped two out of three in Norfolk to the Pirates. Offense has gone cold. Meanwhile, the video game numbers are piling up at Norfolk. This man wrote about it for the Baltimore Banner. It's good to have back on the program our friend, Mr. John Mioli, who's back with us now on GCR. John, it's Glenn. Great to chat with you as always, buddy. Thank you for taking the time for us. Always glad to join. I, I, I knew that uh, when I heard from you that we were going to be dealing with something complicated about the Orioles. Dude. And we get to talk it through together, and everyone I, gets to hear uh, it. Correct. Everyone gets to hear it. Well, and this is the thing. And I, it's funny that you wrote about it because I was leaning towards writing about it. I'm actually going to zero in a little bit more for Press Box this week and what I'm going to write about. Um, but like, I, it's so, it's easy. The easy part is to say, boy, Norfolk scoring a bunch of runs. The Orioles are scuffling. How about that? And like, try to make it seem like there's some sort of correlation between the two things. The complicated part is to say, okay, so what do you want to do about that? Right? Like, so how do the, how do the two interact with each other? And like the comparison part, easy. I get it. You see this, you see this, you say those two things should be related. Now tell me what you're doing about it. And I, getting from step one to step two is something that I am struggling with mightily, John. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, the, the pirates, you know, they use pitchers like major league pitchers the whole time. They didn't use any infielders. They didn't call anybody up from a ball just to cover innings. Like, you know, we're talking about like very distinct, environments and circumstances and challenges but but i think that for the orioles you know to the extent that they're thinking about this nearly as much as anyone outside the organization is which might not be that much maybe they're just like you know whatever but you know this we, we've lost a couple coin flip games we won a couple coin flip games like we'll, we'll be all right um the question that i think like is at the heart of this is like did they really do what they did with the roster for these lefties early in the season, is this really like a temporary stopgap thing? Or do they really think all these guys need to be in the minors for that much longer? Because the lefty spell, A, didn't go well. Right. Um, right. For, considering, you know, they lost four of those five games and, and they're not hitting lefties at all. And B, it's over. Um, it's broadly over. There's, there might be a couple from, you know, I don't know if the uh, hall lines up. I think the Brewers also might have called up a lefty to fill a rotation spot. So maybe they'll see two this weekend, but None in Boston, you know, none after that with the Twins. So how would they go about changing that? Is it Jackson holiday time already? Do they say, you know, we might not need all these right-handed hitters, but there's no reason for Kyle Stowers or Heston Kerstad not to be options for us on the bench. Um, There's a lot of ways to go. It's just very, you know, I think you would need to have a lens into their urgency um, their assessment as to whether it's a problem. Like, I mean, you can tell Brandon Hyde's frustrated with the way the offense is 
performing. I think that's pretty clear from from what he said after the game yesterday, and and I believe why he's seen what it looks like when it looks good. It's really hard to do what they did those first two games, um, but it's not so hard that they can that they that it's you can't do it for a week after that. No, no, not at all. I, so so let's cover a couple of things. You bring up, you know, what what might be first, right? And I've, I've, what I'm going to end up writing about is that, to me, the answer is, like, you don't have a second baseman on this team still. Like, you're just sort of treating second base like a position that exists. And the defense would be, well, maybe because you looked at all those lefties and said, well, Jorge Mateo is going to have to play more at the start of the season, so we need somewhere for him to play. Second base, while not perfect, although he looked pretty good yesterday, not as great on opening day, um, that that's a spot where we could survive with him playing for a little while, but it would feel like second base is the first thing that comes into picture. Now that doesn't address the, what do you do with Heston Kerstad or Kyle Stowers? Cause they're, they're hitting the cover off the ball, but it would feel like whether it's Jackson holiday, or again, I keep saying this. What, what, if it's not going to be Jackson holiday, why wouldn't it be Connor Norby? Like what is going on with that? It feels like the immediacy thing is you could have an everyday second baseman moving forward and that would feel like the, the the first domino that could fall fairly easily, correct? Yes, and and this is you know these are not problems in the sense that like you know there are problems in the world, but right. if if you are going to if you are going to make a case for Connor Norby still being in AAA, other than the opportunity for him to be in the big leagues and that needing to arise and that needing to come in an organic way, it would be that he's probably not the defender the Orioles want at second base. But he's not really playing second base because Jackson Holiday needs to get Correct. that experience in second base. There's only one second base uh, out there. There's only one guy that can play second base every day. I think he, you know, I think he played mostly left field last week in Charlotte. And and you know the reports I got were that it's for a new position. It's not as bad as you would you you would fear it could be. But again, if he's not going to be the defender that the Orioles want him to be, and that's the reason why Connor Norby's down there and he's not playing it's hard to see how he's going to get better with that. So there's just a lot of weird circumstances with this. I think you're right. And that, you know, and I think, you know, my own Jorge Mateo biases are, are, are known, especially on this program um, yep. for, for your yep. long time listeners. And if I, he's, you know, he's not, he's not the issue right now. He's the one, he is hitting lefty. He is doing what he's supposed to be doing. Um, but that's not a permanent solution. You still don't want him out there against righties and you face a lot more righties than you do lefty. So, there is an opportunity for someone to be the big part of that platoon to play full time at that position. And there are options and there are alternatives in the Orioles. I, I think would probably be looking right now as to, as to which of those is most attractive and, and thinking about long and hard about getting them up here. Well, and, and the other complicating factor is that with Jackson holiday, you still, if you, I think by Thursday, call them up, right. You can still qualify for PPI. So I, as as much as I was down on the decision to begin with, it, it was only that I was really down on it because of PPI, right? So if they made the decision, you know, called him up on Thursday to make a, a debut on Friday and still snuck him in under the wire for PPI, I, I wouldn't really be able to criticize it whatsoever at that point because at, opening day is not the end of the world. And if you made the argument, hey, we just wanted to play a little bit more at second base, I could listen to that. I could see that argument. It just feels like you... If you get past Friday, it's almost insane to me where we go with that. It's... Yeah, and and you do wonder too, like you know, if it wasn't about service time or any of these incentives right. or disincentives, then then it can't be about it now, uh, three weeks later. And that's you know that's a complicating factor. I think that you know if if the Orioles put themselves in the position to you know get a PPI draft pick and have Jackson Holiday up this week and and you know all's well that ends well like that's a fine outcome and 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 the process that led everyone there is you know a five and four right now a major league ball club that's not taking good at bats not having someone who that's what he does he takes really good at bats he walked 10 times this week um and you know they're not going to pitch around him in the majors like the triple a but he takes really good at bats you could you could have used that um there's no, there is, you know, there is human capital vol out to what happened. Um, you could have avoided that. There's, there are, there are second derivative things that, that happened um, regarding this decision, even if like the incentive part 
works out and it's, you know, a no harm, no foul. Like, hey, sorry about all that. Like, sure. we'll make it up to you later, buddy. Like, that's all well and good. But, like, other things have happened. Um, and, and those are going to be harder to claw back. That's interesting. That's interesting. I, I, I guess, John, I should follow that up. Like, are, are, are you saying that – can we talk more about that or do we have to leave it at that? Like, do you know that there's frustration there? I mean, I, I mean, we we know what Matt Holiday said on the yeah on the radio show you know, down in, yeah. on the radio interview and then he yeah. talked for you know <laughs> I'm not gonna call Andy an aggregator he aggregated it though right um, right yeah you know it, it was clear that there was frustration there yeah. about how that played out um there's it's it's natural you know there's no there's no getting around the fact that the Orioles you know. That's true. Had a good player I, in, I, in camp, and he, he I would like well to and, think that in, if, like, if we're going to reach a point in the David Rubenstein era where they're going to be spending money, that money can make up for that. Like, I would like to think that, but you know, I it it it's real, and I don't disagree with that. It's real and it's impactful, and it's something that you're going to think about. And so, it it better have been that you really didn't believe he was ready, and that's that's a tougher thing. But we could have that conversation for a long time. Um, uh, John Mioli is with us here on GCR. John, so I, I separate from second base. Obviously, the other guys that we're talking about. Now, you, as you point out, Connor Norby's playing in the outfield. Of course, it's Stowers. It's Kerstad. And the, these numbers are cartoonish. But to say, should they be here? Yeah. To do what is the immediate follow-up, right? Like, th- there's frustration that Colton Kowser isn't playing more than he is. I don't. I, I I hear Orioles fans say things like it's time to move on from Austin Hayes. Tell me what that looks like, or Cedric. Mon- what does that look like when you say that? Are you saying that th- like you just take whatever there is to be had in a trade? I I'm totally fine with second guessing whether or not there should have been more trades made this past off season, but I, the complications of this are significant, and we're also wildly overreacting to nine games of sample size of baseball where these guys still have had moments, even though they have not really consistently hit. And as you point out, kind of stacked against lefties so far. It would seem crazy to me for a baseball team to make wild decisions based on that sample size. Yeah. I don't, I don't, and I don't think they will, you know, this is not who Austin Hayes is. I think that's pretty clear. Um, You know, Cedric Mullins, offers a lot to this team. I don't think that two weeks of guys who were all-stars relatively recently and like performed at all-star levels relatively recently in Cedric Mullins' case, like if he didn't get hurt last year, he's probably there with Austin Hayes or, or, or yeah, when he got, when he got hurt, he was going to be the team MVP at that point, right? <laughs> like he was having yeah. an insane season last year. Yeah. And, and these, you know, this stuff is not too, too far into the, you know, this is not so far in the past that we're talking about, um, you know, ancient history. It's just, re- it's, there's no, there's no, like, you know, there's no way to sound smart about it other than saying this is really complicated. Like, there is, there is no easy or simple or obvious way to get those guys onto the roster that's not, you know, calling them up and having them sit on the bench and, and, you know, sit next to Colton Kowser and make sure everybody celebrates the way they're supposed to <laughs> until, yeah. until their until their time comes in the lineup. Like that is what they would be coming here to do. Um because even if you bring up one of those left handed hitters and you say Austin Hayes, like you're gonna we're gonna get you right against lefties and then you can play grow back into an everyday role as you're kind of figuring out what's going on offensively. Like there's still only one spot for that because Ryan O'Horn exists and Anthony Santander exists. So those guys are gonna be in the lineup against righties too. So there's just not the space for it. And even even the the pipe dream that that people might have of some reactionary move isn't going to make that any better. There's still only well, and, and then it adds to it like in the outfield for these. Yeah, guys. John, imagine like just assuming that because you know Heston Kershaw's off to a great start in Norfolk that he's going to immediately come up and be you know a a, a a a polished power hitter, middle of the order guy on day one in Baltimore. Like I, there's still going to be an adjustment period there. Exactly. And, and, you know, and, and these things, especially when, especially when we're talking about like Hayes and Mullins, like guys who have these stretches where they're really, really good. And then as the season goes on, can tail off and they kind of just end up where they end up offensively. And you know, they always end up in the same relative range. You know, I think other than his all-star season, Mullins has had the same OPS, like three years, three out of four years, the all-star season excluded, you know, Austin Hayes kind of always comes back 
to a level at some point. Like you're thinking about the opposite with these guys. You know, Gunnar Henderson was a rookie of the year last year with an you know treading water for two months and being really, really good for four months. Um, are you going to have are you going to be that much better of a ball club in the second half by letting these guys get this experience now versus versus what the guys who have the experience and these good players who have helped you get to this point and letting them figure it out. It's it's a long-term, you know, gambit. I don't think the Orioles are going to make any decisions for, for taking the series against the Red Sox. Although, you know, every win counts and you want to get as many as possible when you have the opportunity. But, but if you're going to make a case for getting the younger guys up and playing more now, it would be let that adjustment period play out in April so that this team is, cooking in july august september right uh, i'm not sure that is where i'm not sure that's the direction that they would go because it's not as simple as that no and, and i guess the question at, like at some point it will matter right like at some point if if the struggles continue you know if, if and I, I can't imagine austin hayes continues to struggle like this right like he hasn't had a hit in a week like i can't i don't think it's that but if at some point that continues, I know there's the baseball adage of, like, these things work themselves out, right? Someone gets hurt, and that gives you your path to bring somebody else up. Like, that's just sort of the way that managers for an eternity have talked about this. I never hear that from a gen. Well, that's not true. I think I've heard that from general managers, too. Um, but, like, I would, I would think there is a date to all this. Like, I would think that at some point, like, they, they do find themselves saying, all right, we, we've got to do something else. I just don't think it's today. I don't know what that date is. I don't know if it's the end of April. I don't know if it's mid-May. I, I don't know what it is, but I, it's just, I don't think it's April 8th. I think there is a date at some point where they do say, hey, if these guys are continuing to kill it and we're continuing to struggle, we will make a change, even if it's a proven veteran. We just, it, we're trying to win this year. Yeah, and not, 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 and, you know, pitching, hitting, different sizes of the ball, um, different track records and, and trust levels with the players we're talking about. But, you know, Cole Irvin made three starts last year um, before they made made a very quick and clear decision. That's they fair. sent him down to yeah. and they were like, this is not happening. You know, they brought up Spencer Watkins just to cover innings, but they also brought up Yannir Cano, who changed their season. Right. Um, and the Orioles went on a huge run. That was on, like, April 13th or 14th. Um, and the Orioles got – materially better just by making one move because they saw, you know, they envisioned the world where Cole Irvin was in their rotation. Um, he made three starts. They weren't great. They made a change, um, and the team kind of took off from there. So, you know, Cole Irvin is not, you know, the same type of player or impact that, that a Mullins or a, or a Hayes or an Arias has made in the past. Right. Like, these guys have a lot more – have a lot more leeway and, and rope you would assume, but they did make that decision last year and they realized what was going on and they realized that it was time for a change and, and they did it. Um, so I think they have that in them if they want to. Um, and I think if that happens then you will know that like, it's not something that they're taking lightly or doing, you know, making a margin call. Like if they, whenever they do what they're going to do, it's going to be because they feel like something can happen. And, I'm not sure, you know, it'll be on the Cole Irvin timeline, but that timeline exists and that happened and they did that. And yep. that team was, you know, floating around 500, you know, at that point last year. And I'm pretty sure they went on a run and, and, and never looked back from there. So it's possible. Um, I, I couldn't tell you when that timeline is. It's a lot different when the whole offense is, is not really clicking the way that this hasn't for the last week or so. Um, there's nothing like a trip to Fenway. I, I think a lot of these guys hit really well there to, to make, to t- turn that around without a roster move, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. But there's precedent for them doing something um, and, and changing course quickly. They did it last year, and you know, the stakes are even higher this year. No, I'll say that. that that's I think that's also completely fair. I think if this was where they were, it, like Gunnar Henderson got more rope last year, right? Like that's the reality. Gunnar Henderson got more time because. I, nobody there thought they were trying to win the World Series a year ago. Corbin Burns is here for one year. Like that's it. I keep trying to measure everything by that. There is a, there has to be at least some sense of urgency here. You've got this guy for one year, um, likely, right? Like I, again, money can change things, but likely you've got this guy for one year. And I do think, to your point, that does have to accelerate certain decisions that you make because of viewing things through that prism. 
Yeah, and and you know, just you know, to to end it on that, you know, that's why they structured the roster in part the way they did to begin the season because right. right. Jackson Holiday's development at the major league level, if you want to hit the really get better at hitting major league left handed pitching, yep. the way to do that is hit major league left handed pitching. But they said, we don't want to get him to get better here. He's not going to play against lefties. We want to win games. We want to have guys who can hit lefties. We need right handed hitters to fill up the lineup to face these lefties because we need to win every single game we can to make sure we get in the playoffs, to make sure we're there in October, you know, with a chance to go through that tournament. And that was why they did that. That's probably why they're going to do a lot of things this year because. That's the reality. There's a lot of good teams in the AL, and they need to keep pace. So I, I think that's going to inform a lot. John Mioli, of course, you can read his column. We've linked it up on Twitter at Glenn Clark Radio about the perfect storm brewing. And, of course, follow him on Twitter at John Mioli. Is there anything else I can plug for you, my friend? I don't think so. You know, I'm, I'm looking for opportunities to get arms on the farm going back. I, up. Dude, I was the Miley game on Friday, and uh, – there's, you know, there's not. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's going to be. There's going to be some real. There's yeah. going to be some real arms on the farm action. It's coming back. Oh, oh, I'm you excited about first. that. Okay, I, you know, I'm an arms on the farm guy, so you know that that excites me. But I always thought the joke was you've been watching. Like nobody wants to talk about. It. Everybody's talking about how many runs that Norfolk is scoring. Nobody's talking about the other side where like they've needed to score all of those runs because yeah. they've yeah, given no, up. You know, Wow. Different circumstances down there, but you know, yeah. Bowie's got like a ton of dudes that are interesting. You know, Aberdeen's coming home. I'm, I don't think the schedule is going to line for any arms on the farm in Aberdeen this week, but I'm excited to I'm excited to get up there and 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 do some farming. I look forward to that. I love arms on the farm. The Baltimore That's where you find it. John Mioli. We'll talk again soon. You know that. Always appreciate you, brother. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. John Mioli with us here on GCR. Again, it's a complicated conversation that's not great for what we do. Not John, John's very thoughtful, and he handles complicated things all the time. It's not great for sports talk radio because you like there to just be an answer. I will inevitably dumb it down. Yes, Connor Norby's playing in the outfield because Jackson Holiday is the second baseman, which also goes back to the kind of hilarity of that you wouldn't give Connor Norby a chance. Like, you literally went to the length of moving his position. He couldn't play the position he was playing any longer. But instead, you didn't have the guy at the major league level. But instead of saying, all right, let's give him a shot, you went to the length of moving his position. I think you know the answer. I think the answer is Jackson Holiday should be here by Friday. Part because the answer was Jackson Holiday should have been here on opening day. But I can live with it, again, because my point is about PPI. And you can still qualify for PPI as long as he's here by the end of the week. Like, you'd have to call him up. Maybe they'd have to call him up Wednesday because that would be the 14th day. I, I don't know. Like If it goes by it, days or games. Or hours, yeah, you know hours. what I mean? Like, if... If the season started at 3 p.m. on right. the on that Thursday. Thursday, does he need to be called up by 2:59 this Thursday in order to qualify for PBI? So the Dodgers and Padres would have had to do this last week. If yeah, I don't know how it, exception, or, or is it two weeks worth of games? Yeah, I, bro. Now we're getting into the weeds a little bit. Should be yeah, I don't know. It might be that they have to put him on the roster on Wednesday because that's the 14th day of the season. And then that gets complicated because if he's on the roster on Wednesday, then are you really like committing to not playing him on Thursday so his debut can be at home on Friday? You know what I mean? Like in my mind, you call him up on Thursday and then it's all good, but now you're short a man on your bench because you are playing a night game again on Thursday, right? It's not another is I don't think it's an afternoon game on Thursday. I think it's a night game. You got the schedule right behind you, don't you? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. Why why wouldn't you just turn around and look? It is a night game. Night game on Thursday. So if you're committed to Jackson Holiday's debut being on Friday at home, then you leave yourself short a man on the bench. Now, you know, you haven't been using Tony Kemp anyway, right? Like, there's a point, but it's 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 more like it doesn't become theater of the absurd. Do you get into extra innings on Thursday, and you're like, Refusing. well, we're not putting Jackson Holiday in the game? And I think the answer would be, Ramon Arias comes up the bat. You need a lefty <laughs> going against a righty. And you you try. To not have him play on Thursday, but you say, hey, if he ends up having it bad, it's not the end of the world. Like, 
it still is home debut on Friday, if that's the case, right? Like, it's it's okay. It's for starts. Yeah. But you do your best to not have him play on Thursday. If necessary, he plays, is my thought process in all of this. I think that's the answer, and I'll write about that today. But if it ain't, then the answer's – it's – what are you trying – if you're just des- deciding today Connor Norby will never be able to be a second baseman, which is weird to me. I have not heard that opinion – it's funny, John Mioli pointed out that the people that he've talked, he's talked to have said they're concerned about his second base defense. They don't have a second baseman. They don't have one. Like, everybody they're playing is someone outside of Westberg when he plays second base. But again, I, I, I think it's time for him to settle in and be the third baseman, and I, I'm ready for Ramon Arias to... Yeah. Have a good look. Yeah. No... Well, I mean, he could hang out with... I, like, I don't want to compare him to Tony Kemp because I like Ramon Arias. Tony Kemp's not... I feel nothing towards... T- Tony Kemp can... Yeah, like Ramon Arias, like when we talk about the A's and the White Sox, like he's, right. he could contribute to this. He could contribute... To I think he could contribute to teams... I think he could contribute to the Royals right now. I think he could contribute to teams... I The way that he contributed to the Orioles the last couple of years, I think he could... I think when... It's like the starter pack includes Ramon Arias... And then you're ready to move past the starter pack. And I think the Orioles are ready to move past the starter pack. So I think it's just time for him to be in the AL Central. You know what I mean? Like any of those teams that are are good but not, you know, really a threat to win a World Series, go there. You know what I mean? I mean that. Yeah, I know the exactly. NL I know exactly what you mean. I think he could go be on the Cubs and be a helpful hand. All right, today's show. That was the best analogy I think you could make. Is it? Yeah. Just time for him to go to the AL Central. I'm, it's time. It's a nice place. It's well, nice. Not in April, but yeah. No, not in April. You're right about that. There's nothing nice about the AL Central in April. God. There is not at least in like in the NL Central, you get games in Milwaukee that are indoors. Right. You know what I mean? Like they don't even get indoor games. The AL Central is just all you are playing forty degree miserable, games cold, the entire month of April. Brutal. Like in the AL East, you get to go down to Tampa, maybe. They might close the roof in Toronto. Like you, there might be a pleasant day in there. You get to beat, you know, the the best ballpark Fenway and, and, and Camden Yards, you know. I guess. Like it doesn't really change the weather. <laughs> like Ballpark can be nice. Like, there's nice ballparks everywhere, but it doesn't change the weather. Um, man, the, the AL Central has got to be the worst place to be in April. Like, awful. Yeah. But it's, you know, the rest of the year, like, go, see the rock, go see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> like, you know, check out the Negro League Hall of Fame while you're down in Kansas yeah. City. Go get some spaghetti at M&M's place. Like, apparently it's terrible. That's what I've heard really? is that the spaghetti's no good. Uh, do whatever they do in Minnesota. I don't. Uh, you go to Paisley Park while you're there. Well, isn't that the point? By? Because you throw up, mom's. Oh, is that what it is? They want so, it to be awful, so you I guess can so, right? get it. I mean, that's get it all over your shirt. Uh, in Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. It's a happening town, man. A lot of stuff going on in Chicago. Hey, it's just time. It's just time. It feels like I'm trying to put him in a home. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be hey, great. Hey, Grandma, oh. look at all the activities they have. They got bingo. They've got bingo. They've got bingo. <laughs> Come on. The game start at 6 p.m. every night. It's Let's go. It really is. Yeah, like a nursery. All right. All right. We come back in, Jeremy Con. What a hero Jeremy was for me yesterday, too. By the way, he ended up doing the. He sat in on the entirety of our show with Rita. The entirety. Of the well, he told me. I was not going to ask him to do this, but I was talking last week about how I was going to have to leave early to go to WrestleMania. Like noon or anything, yeah. Well, I was so last Sunday. I said, "Hey, next Sunday uh, to Rita." I was like, "Next Sunday, I'm going to have to duck out early. We'll figure something out." But I'm I'm going up to WrestleMania, and Jeremy just happened to be there as I was saying, and he was like, "Well, dude, I'll I'll do the last hour with Rita," and I was like, "Well, you don't have to do that. Like, that's too much." And he was like, "No, no, no. I'll go see my grandfather." You know, after because he does a show from eleven to noon, mm-hmm. I'll go see my grandfather, and I'll come back and do the last hour. But then he wasn't able to go see his grandfather yesterday, so he was like, "Well, I'll just be like sitting in the other room doing work." I'm like, "Well, if you're gonna be sitting here, you might as well do the show with us." <laughs> so sure enough, sat in for the whole show with us. Yesterday, what a hero! Which was very, very meant so that I could duck out for literally. It was the difference in forty minutes. <laughs> I left at two twenty. 
how you ended up sticking around for. <laughs> I said I would do the first show, and then Adam Jones called in, uh, yeah. and there was a whole thing. So then I finally got to the point where like my buddy was like looking at me, he was like itching, he wanted to go, he wanted to go to the big superstore that WWE put together in Philadelphia. So WWE like, World. Uh, we didn't even go to like the huh. the convention part of it. We just went to the I store, guess, yeah. uh, which is fine. Well, yeah, it was fine. You had to do something. Yeah, we did something. We went to WrestleMania. Had the worst seats ever. They were free. And I was thankful. I was thankful. They were terrible bad seats. Bad seats at Terri- WrestleMania? I don't terrible. think. That doesn't, terrible that doesn't sound right. <laughs> awful seats. But, it's not a bad seat. But I didn't pay a penny for them, and I had a good time. I had fun. That was what mattered. Were, Jim, you, doing, were you doing these? I did not. I did not do that. I did not do that. There was, man, everybody hates Logan Paul, but there was one guy sitting in front of us that was like trying to be, like, to, for the sake of being a contrarian, he was being like the huge Logan Paul fan, and I swear it nearly came to blows. You were going to. Also, we were, in the, we were in the upper deck at the link. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Um, I, think, uh, I wanted to take a break. I got to take a break because yeah, we got to get to Jeremy. Right. We were in the upper deck at the link. There was a guy that was drunk. I watched. I swear to God, he tumbled out. We were in like the tw- oh, – I mean, we were up. We were like in the 12th or the 13th how many row. People, how many people was that stadium? 70, I mean, there were 72,000, I think, there. Um, this guy tumbled down four row. He fell in his seat and I swear was so drunk – that his fall continued for four rows of seats before someone stopped him. Jeez. Like, I've never... And it was weird. Like, I don't know how they just weren't people in those seats. It was, like, late in the night. But, like, four rows. This guy tumbled before, like, somebody grabbed him. Jeez. And I didn't see it was happening until... It was tumbled on you. Like, <laughs> I was like, what the hell? It's crazy, man. All right, Jamie Kahn joins us next. Glenn Clark Radio. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates. A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Whether you're celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at ruthschris.com. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports & Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. The latest edition of Press Box is available now, and on the cover we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolka on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinators. Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area 
locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. By the way, and by the way, Bird for Life, remind me who you are. I know you've told me before, but you got to remind me who you are at some point, just, just when we have these conversations. But Bird for Life 49 on Twitter. Uh, I'm definitely with you on the camp conclusion on the roster. If it's not Norby or Holiday, why not just stick with Westberg Mateo? And you could have started Nevin at third base, who has a career 353 OPB against lefties. Absolute argument. Absolute. If that's really what this was about, strong argument, in fact. Cannot justify Tony Kemp. There is just no world where Tony Kemp's inclusion on this roster can be justified. I, I'm not talking about, like, I, I hope that when I talk about Arias, it doesn't sound like the way I'm talking about Kemp. Kemp, to me, is not an Oriole. Ramon Arias is an Oriole, and I respect him. I just think that you can do better at this point. Again, it's time. The AL Central is beautiful. What does Tony Kemp do to you? I, it's... It's not personal. Right, yeah, I know. I it's not you. personal. Yeah. Yeah, There's right, just right, no right. like you you look at this roster and you say what that's that's someone who would be here in 2020. The, in 2023, Tony 2024, sorry. 2024, Tony Kemp holding a roster spot? It's it I, again, I don't want to come out too strongly because I I have so much respect for Michael Elias, but it's laughable. I also feel like they should have better depth than Jonathan Heasley. I'm I gotta be I can't believe Jonathan Heasley was your option. We didn't I don't want to keep laboring about it. Like I can't believe that you got to a point where Jonathan Heasley was your option. I get it. You you would use a lot of your bullpen by that point and but man, I can't believe that that's where you were. That Jonathan Heasley was the guy to go in that game. All right. Um this man was a hero for me yesterday. Good guy. Allowed me to get up to uh, WrestleMania. Stuck around. Ended up doing the whole show with us. It's just a weird way that it worked out. Uh, but that was fun. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, to my knowledge, we haven't been fired yet. So we've got that going for us. From the Big Bad Morning Show on 105.7 The Fan. And, of course, ambassador to the Green Turtle. Or for the Green Turtle. I don't know if it's an ambassador to somewhere. He is Jeremy Kahn. And he's back with us now here on GCR. What's going on, buddy? How are you? Yeah, Mr. Kemp, he wants to trade your son. He just wants to get rid of the guy. He said, cut him. Hey, what's up, Glenn? I'm just talking to Tony Kemp's dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> how's yeah. He, how's he, how is Sean Kemp? I haven't seen him in a long time. <laughs> like, what's... Yeah, he's just one of his other kids. Yeah, he's just <laughs> making more babies. He's actually having sex in the back of the car right now. So It's nice, it's nice but, to uh, drive him around. Yeah, I, by the way, i got to ask you. So I saw your picture from where your seats were. Oh, on, my right? God. Where, it was, your seats weren't great, like, right? No, awful. And, off. I mean, I'm not trying to crap there. on it because I've been no. there. I, like, no. I sat nosebleeds to things that I didn't want to. But how was the experience, though? Oh, I had a great time. So, look, here's the deal. I would not have gone to WrestleMania. I, I've been a bunch of times. Um, you know, I, I've done it, and I've, I think I've just kind of moved on from it. Um, but my buddy Brandon, uh, so Brandon I do the Jobbing Out podcast with. People don't know Brandon Linton. He's the booker at Rams Head Live. He's one of my favorite people ever. He worked for the Ravens for a little bit. We kind of connected because we're both wrestling fans. And we become very close friends. And Brandon was like, hey, I can get free tickets for WrestleMania. But he, like, warned me they're not going to be good. And Brandon, whenever he gets tickets to something, like, they're normally incredible. They're usually good. If Brandon invites me to something, it's almost laughable how good this is. Like, he invited me to Weezer last summer. I'm not even a huge Weezer fan, but, like, I like all the same Weezer songs that everybody else likes. You know, like, I'll sing along to Buddy Holly and have the time of my life. But, like, we got there, and they were in, like, the second row. I'm like, right, of course. Of course they are, because that's the way that this goes. So Brandon invited, but he warned me. He's like, hey, the scenes aren't very good. But by Brandon's standards, I was expecting that to mean, like, instead of being – Yeah, ex- <laughs> that's exactly what I thought he meant. Like, I'm not kidding. When he says that, I'm like, dude – Okay, guy. Like, I know what this means. You're saying I won't be able to smell Roman Reigns, but, you know, I'll still see every piece of sweat glistening off of him. And oh, then, beautiful. then when we got there yesterday, or when we were arriving, he was like, dude, you understand we're in, like, the top level. I was like, oh. Oh. And then yeah, we were well, in the... Look, we, 
We were in We've the all corner. been there, though. Like, yeah. you're trying to get tickets to something. You, you Like, if you want to go or somebody offers it to you. I was just wondering what the experience is like. For you no, it's watching, still, like, like, I, like the big oh, al- almost entirely. Almost entirely on the big okay. screen. Like, I would I would look down every now and then, and then I'd be like, eh, I'll look back up at the big screen now. Um, I, I still had a good time. Yeah, and but, one, but to your I, I, I think was just say, your friend, but he also invited me over to his house. Right. And you talk about having great seats. Yeah. I watched Roadhouse and he let me sit on his lap. That's it amazing. Was the best seat in the house. What a good time. Is that true? Uh, it's weird because he's never sucks. he's he's never invited me over to do that. I don't understand. Oh, um, no. Well, look, we just met on Sunday. Yeah, look, you know how this is. You go to something with a buddy you like and you're happy. Like, you know, I'm going to have a good time. We had a great time. We we bitched about wrestling like we were, you know, 16 years old. We had yeah. fun. You know what I mean? Like, that was a fun time. And I was there, and everybody was wearing their cosplay costumes. Like, there were, you know, adult males dressed as gold dust and Mick Foley throughout the crowd. We had a good... I, you probably could have done this with Ray Bachman at some point in your life, sat in the same seats and walked away from it saying, mm-hmm. I had a great night. I'm glad I did that. And it didn't cost me. I paid like thirty bucks to park. That's the entirety of what this event cost me. So like, I'll live. Brandon and I both agree. We would never if if somebody had told me, "Hey, we're gonna go to WrestleMania. These seats cost even if it was like something affordable, like sixty bucks." I would say no, no. I'll watch from home. I'm not gonna pay sixty bucks to sit in the upper deck at WrestleMania. But for free and there with your buddy and having a good time, I had a great time. So, so you can't beat it. No, no that's cool. No. I, I was just wondering what the experience was like because, you know, I've gone to wrestling events and, and I've sat in, like, bad seats. But even in, like, in-house stuff, there's really not a bad seat in those smaller I, arenas, but in a big stadium. Yeah. I oh, wonder. correct. And, I, and I'm out on all that in general. Like, I'm, when I was a younger man, I could, I could sit far away and still feel like, hey, I'm here. That matters. I'm just out on that now. Like, I, it, it's weird. I don't feel that way necessarily at a baseball game. Like, Griffin and I, we weren't in the okay. upper deck, but we sat in, like, center field r- underneath the scoreboard on opening day, very far away, and I, did, I st- didn't feel that. I still felt, like, very much like I was involved. And, like, maybe it's because the sight line's pretty good from there. Like, it, I, it's worse when you're, like, on the, down the left field line and in the corner, and then you're like, I don't even feel like I'm at the game. Um, at yeah. baseball games, mostly anywhere in the stadium, I still feel like I'm there. I'm in it. I, in fact, prefer sitting um, behind home plate uh, in the upper deck at a baseball game. It's one of my favorite seats. Um, it's why uh, Josh Roca and his crew uh, do the Section 334 pod. Is it 336? Sorry, 336. Um, is because that's where their seats are, right? Like, and, and they've got great – I've sat in their seats. They're great. They're perfect for watching mm-hmm. a baseball game. You see everything. At hockey games, notoriously, the best place to sit is up top because it's the easiest way to follow the puck, right? Like, you never yeah. miss the puck when you're sitting up top at a hockey game. It's why at hockey games the press box is actually all the way at the top of the arena is so that you can follow the game easier. Um, at, a, at a wrestling event, no. I would never, I, I would never pay money to do that, to sit there. It's, it, you're, you be, might as well not be there at that point. But, yeah, um, I've never been to a hockey game, but I've never missed puck either because I remember him from Real World. Oh he yeah, stuck his he had, fingers in and, the peanut butter, and then the snot. But he put his just, finger in the peanut butter. <laughs> didn't he? And didn't he have an issue? What was the gay dude's name on that episode? On that season of Pedro uh, Zamora. Pedro, thank you. And yeah, that was sad. Man, there's a did, didn't some of the other people on that uh, season of uh, the Real World turn out to be not like great dudes either? Or am I? Com- yeah, there were a couple of them. Couple who was the one? Who was the girl that dude. made out with Puck? Oh, I can see your face. I think she po- didn't she pose for Playboy. I think you're right about that. Was it that. Beth? Beth, that was might be Beth? right. That might be right that it was Beth. All right, we could just talk about real uh, what world. A fool for- is it what right? was the Jesus. what was what was your favorite season of the Real World? Two, that one. Okay, I would go with Seattle. Yeah. Seattle stands. With- well, the Puck and Pedro thing just—I had so many laughs because of Pedro's thick accent. When he was a puck, why you put your ping on the peanut butter? You, put, <laughs> you don't have to put your ping on the peanut butter. You use something else to put it. You know, like I love that. So that um, was pretty I good. Puck was such a weirdo too. Well, yeah. he was, and that that was a fact. He was a huge weirdo. Um, uh, yeah. Of course, the the real world Seattle famous for the slap scene, yeah. where yeah. where David slapped like Irene. It was David who slapped David. Irene because yeah. she called him. She told him he was gay. Um, <laughs> As she was leaving the house, and he slapped her, and it was, it was one of the most shocking things ever at the time. 
Um, and then also in Seattle, you had the one girl, the, the whitest girl you've ever seen in your entire life trying to work on a song with Sir Mix-a-Lot, which was just like my favorite thing for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> Like it was, I loved that season of the real world. I love Seattle. I and told you I auditioned to get on that. Show. No, no. Did you really? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you the story. Yeah. So there was a, uh, I took off from the pizza shop and I was working at the radio station, like uh, kind of like part-time. Maybe, I, maybe it was when I was interning or just after they hired me when I first got in the radio. And there was something at the, I think it was a nine thirty club down like DC. And uh, so they invited people down and they would take you into groups and you got to try out for, real world and road rules so you get interviewed and it was so it was so lame because like if you weren't if you weren't one of the beautiful people or if you didn't really stand out like it's you're just basically walking through i heard some guy coming out and he's like yeah man that sucks because he got pulled to a table of 10 people he's probably the most uninteresting white man there and like in my group i had a a girl that was a model an african model I had um, this Hispanic girl that was a dancer that said she okay. danced for the president two days before. <laughs> and then they get to me, and, and then I drop my drawers, and I just said, I'm a prisoner of love. And I had a pair of boxer shorts on it with a heart but in a jail cell and the keys outside of it. And I got up and just started shaking my boxers or whatever. And everybody looked at me like, who's this effing weirdo? But I wanted to be noticed for right, something crazy. Right, correct, because you know? that would get you, and yeah. So I did that. It was one of the most, like, I don't get embarrassed easily. <laughs> It was one of the most embarrassing things. There was literally one person that laughed at me that really like just lost it, laughed at everybody else. was like, this guy's effing weird. Wow. But, you know, man. I wanted to leave an impression. So I never got a call back. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. But, but it really did suck when you think you're going to be interviewed for it and they bring Dude. you in with a group of 10 and you may not be asked a question. You may have just waited right. for three hours not to even answer a question when you get in there. So, so okay. Um, all right, hang on. Two things. I'm closing this part of the conversation by telling you I had it wrong. It wasn't David. It was Steven from the real world Seattle who oh. was the slap. And I just found this out from Chris who messaged me. Apparently, years later, he actually did come out as gay. So Irene was right the oh. entire time. But it's still it was it. kind of messed up to say it on television. But that doesn't also does not give you permission to slap someone. Let's cover all of our grounds here, all of our bases. None of it okay. Um, I, yep. I always wanted to be on Wheel of Fortune, right? Like, I... You make fun of me. My grandmother. So, so tell me I'm low rent, but I loved Wheel of Fortune. So I, like seven or eight years ago, maybe whatever it was, uh, I they did a casting call in Hunt Valley, and I did it, and they called me up on stage, and I I did a whole shtick where I, they were like, all right, Glenn, tell us about yourself. And I was like, well, I'm an avid vintner and a state senator, and like I just made up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and the guy was like, wow, really? And I was like, no, I just thought that that would be more exciting than if I told you I was a chubby radio DJ. Like, I just thought that that would play better. Um, so they loved me, and I won the round or whatever, and they invited me back for a, another, like, a private casting call that they did in Towson. And I went through that, and I nailed that, and they were like, you know, you're going to be on. You'll receive some information in the mail. And literally, they sent me the dates that I was going to Los Angeles to be on Wheel of Fortune. And my buddy and I were, like, already making our plans. He was going to go with me. We were freaking out. And then somebody called me a day later and said, hey, we got to do one more round of, you know, vetting before you can do this. And one of the questions was, have you ever worked for, you know, I guess Fox Broadcasting? And I was like, no. And they said, have you ever worked for a Fox affiliate? And, like, very briefly for Fox 45, I did, like, three freelance like oh. things for them that were like, I swear to God for a little while they used me as whenever they would have products sent and they needed to lie to try to make it like newsworthy, but really they were just getting money to promote the product. We've all been there. It's not, yeah. it's not uncommon. They hired me for like 50 to 75 bucks to come over and be there. I swear to God, Jeremy lifestyle expert. That's a thing. They use that term. They didn't say Glenn Clark from the radio station that doesn't exist anymore. They said Glenn Clark lifestyle expert. And I came over and was like, here's the hot new products for the summer. And it was some dumb crap that you would never want, never buy. Or like, here's some new board games you could try with your kids. And I said, well. Do you think if you lied, you would have got one so anyway? Like it's, you... it's so funny you said Because I, I said, I was like, look, you know, I've done. But I wasn't working for them. It was just freelance. You know, and they said, sorry, you're out. You can't come. I was like, Jesus Christ, that sucks. Um, and then I asked someone that I knew that worked in television, like, could I have just lied? 
And they said for a bigger show, like if you were going to go beyond, for example, like the real world, no. But for Wheel of Fortune, probably. Like probably you could have yeah. just lied and gotten away with it because they only do like one round of vetting for Wheel of Fortune. For a show... Yeah, you, yeah go ahead. No, I was going to say, I had an ex-girlfriend that was on um, Jeopardy. It was crazy. Like there was this dude I used to play two-on-two basketball with. And so we went to these tournaments and we won a bunch of stuff. Um but, uh, you know, he had to make a shot. It was a hook shot, or at least I did, with, with the left hand. And I was shooting at the Sudan. So she got on the show because he knew a guy that used to play ball with that was on. Uh, by the way, I'm doing White Men Can't Jump. Yeah, I right. I, 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 I was, I was trying I, to figure out when we were getting there. <laughs> no. No, man. It's funny you brought a Wheel of Fortune because, like, my, I would play that with my grandmother all the time. and We'd always talk about, like, how we should go on one of those, you know, when they have – their special weeks or whatever, try out for it. I've never, I don't think I've ever tried out for a game show, but I'd love to be on. Oh, it was fun as hell. It was a lot of fun going through the process. Like, and they, I I would tell you, they definitely also pick people to go through the process that are there to be like the stooges. Like they don't just pick people that are, it, it makes more sense when you watch the show and you're like, how did this person, this seems like the easiest puzzle of all time. Why did that person just, it, it clearly says like, Babe Ruth and that person just guessed a G. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. <laughs> it's because they they do pick some of those people too. But uh yeah, it was cool. It was a cool process. All right, I don't know what we're doing. I have no idea what any of this is. I don't know what just happened. We got off on a tangent yeah, like right. usual. The real world and then the whole thing. Um uh one, what's what happens? You and I talked about it briefly tonight. I, I think UConn is just that much better than everybody else. I I just don't see it. With Purdue, I know you said you're going to see it what the public does because that's what you do, but I just don't mm-hmm. see it from Purdue tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm on Purdue plus the points. The line is moving. It went from six to seven and a half now as more money's coming in on UConn. The one thing I'll say this this entire game depends upon how they officiate the game with Zach Eady because if he's getting calls like you know he typically should because he gets fouled quite a bit and they don't call it because he's just an enormous human being. Um, but Klingon for um, for UConn is the best, at least in my opinion, the best on ball defender, one on one for center. Um, he just he stifles guys. He makes it really difficult. And Zach, uh, you know, Edie's still going to get his. Don't get me wrong, but it's just a matter: does he make life difficult? And if he's able to do that and they slow it down, I think we see a lower scoring game. Um, but my big thing is I think Braden Smith plays well tonight. So I'm not going to give you Purdue wins outright. I would not be shocked. But I think Purdue covers and UConn wins a close one, but we get a good game. Okay. All right. I can I, I, I could see that path. I don't know, man. UConn is just a different animal to me, man. Like they just I, I, I feel the same way, but like, again, if they officiate in Zach Eady's favor, then all of a sudden I think UConn because look, if and there's gotta be a big emphasis on, on Eady tonight to kick the ball out because Purdue's one of the top, if not the top three point shooting team in the country. Right. And but UConn is the deepest team by far. It's not even close. So when you look at these two teams meeting up, I think UConn has way more talent. But I do think, you know, Braden Smith and Zach Eady are two X factors, of course. But if they're calling fouls in Eady's favor, that's going to be a long night for UConn. That is because, true. That I is mean, true. He's just, yeah, I, I just don't know they have enough size to sit there and try to compete with them the whole game if Klingon gets in foul trouble. Where are you at with, um, like, the the entire conversation about, Caitlin Clark after she lost yesterday is difficult for me, right? Because we all know this girl did everything in her power to will what was not a power program into the picture, and it's a it's a miracle that Iowa basketball was in back-to-back championship games. But it's also kind of a bummer that they didn't... I, I don't know how to talk about this, because we, we, we all are smart enough to know we can't judge Caitlin Clark by not winning a cha- championship, but it's still kind of a bummer that she didn't figure out a way to win one. Yeah. I mean, this is my big, pro- so like, and I said it this morning on the show, cause I heard so many people, like even I heard uh, Brianna Stewart. I watched some of the, the ESPN with uh, Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi. And uh, I forget the other girl's name, uh, NECA or whatever. Um, I, I mean, not pronounce the last name, but anyway, so they were doing the breakdowns of it. And then they were going to like some other players, like Brianna Stewart and said, if she doesn't win, uh, can she be one of the greatest? And she said no. And I totally disagree with that, man. Like, wow. first off, there's a, the thing we have now is that there's another level 
of basketball, right? There's a, there's a professional level of basketball for women, whether we decide to or not. Like, I don't look back at, and I understand college basketball had been the mecca for women for a long period of time. There was no pros, but there is another level. So I don't know why in college we're going to look at it and go, oh, they didn't win. They didn't do this. You know, uh, Larry Bird took Indiana State to a final and they lost. And, uh, and then he got to the NBA and won a bunch of championships. It's a team game. I think we can look at individuals and say things like, I don't know how you feel. Yeah, Barry th- Bonds is arguably oh, yeah. the greatest hitter oh, in my no question. Right. And he never, no won a, question. never won a World Series. So right. I can make that statement, you know. No. I think, I, I just I think like that's that thrown out there too much. I think it's weird because I think it's, it's easier like, – it's easier to do that in baseball. It's easier to do that with a non-quarterback in football, right? Like, I feel like we kind of put it, there's only so much in those worlds that, like, one player can control, right? Like, it, in baseball, you you can't bat more than one time, like, every nine guys. So mm-hmm. any one player can only have so much control of the game. In yep. football, if you're not a quarterback, like, Larry Fitzgerald will – be to me one of the five greatest players i like saw of this era and he did have a quarterback at one point they didn't win a super bowl they got awfully close um but like Mm -hmm. i i don't judge larry fitzgerald by whether or not he wins a championship because there's only so much that any player that isn't a quarterback can do but yet we do that with quarterbacks right because we believe they can control that much and i feel like that's the conversation in basketball is that we believe that one basketball player really can make that significant of an impact. We know better. Like we watched that t- that, w- that that first Cavs team that LeBron James willed to the championship. To me, is maybe the greatest moment of LeBron James' career. That team yeah. had nothing. I mean, diddly poo, nothing. Well, look at what the Spurs did to him the first time when Doc, when um, Pop was like, "Man, all they got is that that cat over there." Like. We got we to gotta double him, get the ball out of his hands, and make someone else beat us. Correct. Sure enough, they, they just frustrated the hell out of LeBron. A hundred percent. The fact that he got there, like they beat the Pistons, a good Pistons team mm-hmm. en route. Yeah. As much as LeBron James has accomplished since then, he's, that to me stands out as his greatest accomplishment, that he got them there because it was him. It was nothing. We all know that, like, while we credit LeBron for, like, say, the Cavaliers' ultimate championship, let's tell the truth about that. Like, dude, Kyrie really won them that ring down the stretch, right? Like, that that yeah. was a Kyrie story that season. And they got fortunate that Draymond got suspended. 100%. And, uh, all part of, 100% all part of the story. So I, it's weird when we talk about basketball because we do believe that, like, one player can have more of an impact. We just know enough to know that it can't just be one player. And the Caitlin Clark story, the fact that Iowa was there to be not – I don't want to be disrespectful to those other girls. Martin's a hell of a player. Um, Stolte's mm-hmm. a hell of a player. But, like, that wasn't a championship-caliber team. They were only a championship-caliber team because of the presence of Caitlin Clark. Getting to two championship yeah, games way, is an amazing statement. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and that stuff's impressive. The easiest way I put it was, like, we, we all can agree Caitlin Clark was the best basketball player on the floor last night, right, as it stands. Like, yeah. right, you, you think yeah, she was the best that. player. Yes. yes. But the next five to seven best players are more than likely on the other yes. team. Yes, 100%. So, like, that's, that's what we're talking about. And that's not dismissing the Iowa girls are good, but this is a team that went undefeated. Don Staley's lost three games in the past, what, three years? Like, yep. come on. Yep. What are we doing here? No what are we talking about? Because, no like, doubt. and that's my problem is that everything has to be a hot take. Everything's got to be labeled now. Is she one of the greatest of all time? She's never even played professionally yet. Is she this? Is she that? And when people start saying that she's, you know, she can't be labeled one of the greatest because she didn't win college basketball, where, like, you don't have a lot of control over that stuff of who's, there's no, like, Don Staley or whoever, if we're going to talk about LSU, they can go out and recruit, and then you can bring in these players. And, and I'm sure with the um, NIL money and the transfer portal, people say, well, Iowa could have done that too. Who the F wants to go to Iowa? Right. Correct. Who, Correct. It was a one. In, it was a one in a million scenario where there was a girl from Iowa who didn't even want to go to Iowa. She wanted to like, go to UConn. She wanted to go to UConn, and Gino Ariama Ar- Ar- missed on that. Although, as a lot of people pointed out, probably wouldn't have been the same fit because he would have wanted her to do what they do, not what she does. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a one in a million scenario that it played out this way. That like her backup plan was all play at home. Um, you know, in, in, incredible story, inc- amazing. And by the way, I do think that like the the reverberations of this, the number of people that I have had in my life that have now told me. I'm going to watch the WNBA and I've never watched before. Like 
I, I do think this continues to we'll have see. legs. I, I believe yeah, this I continues so. to have legs. Well, the, the, you know, the other part of this, too, what, what, uh, so what the Yukon girls were going back to talking about Sue Bird and, and Diana Taurasi, the one thing that they said is that in the history of when you argue over anything, statistics, wins, championships, all that, she's like winning, no one can argue it. When you win, it's like there's no argument against it. That's what you're supposed to do, right? With statistics, somebody can say, well, they played a really fast game or she shot the ball 50 times a game, whatever. You can argue some of that stuff. It's the hardware that nobody ever argues with. And it's, it's why, like, I look at sports differently than some other people because I can look at somebody and say, that's one of the five best players I've ever seen and not go, oh, my God, I can't put them in my top five because they don't have a chance. Right. I, I don't right. buy into that. It's a team game. It's not an individual thing. But you're right. I do feel like basketball is the quickest sport that you can turn around by getting one really great individual. No question. And other sports, it doesn't happen like that unless it's a quarterback or, you know, you got it. What's your week look like? Uh, it's going to be interesting this week. Um, so I, I've got a – I'm still dealing with all this legal stuff. but uh, <laughs> So I got, I got all that going on, but I, I'm in. I'm Like Ed's, Ed's off tomorrow and Wednesday. Is he's, going, he's going to see the Orioles up at Fenway. Well, that's cool. And then he's off for like three weeks. He's going to have shoulder surgery. So it's going to be a lot of Rob and God, he's myself old. on the morning show. Jesus, yeah, he's so. old. Man, he is Please, so, yes, Ed. so old. God. Um, and are you over at uh, the Green Turtle at all? Um, yeah, I'm, I'll be over there this week. Uh, I'm not doing tonight. I mean, look, it's a, the game nine this pisses me off so, so much. We got the 3 so o'clock bad. game yesterday, and then we get the 9 so whatever bad. night. It's so God. bad. And, yeah. like, I, I get it. It's the, hey, the West Coast matters. Like, the West Coast can matter at 832. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, you can play the game at 830. 920 is sick. It's perverted. It is, like, th- th- this is openly spitting in the face of your own game. Like... Yeah, this game doesn't go off until uh, close to midnight, I think, with the long halftime, one shining moment, all that stuff. Yep. It's like, yep. Yeah. It's going to be one of those. All right, buddy. At Jaycon Sports, and um, uh, are you still doing the Telegram until the website is? Yeah, yeah. So people, if they want to sign, like I'm keeping it free for April as long as I can for right now, and, and, and depending on how long this, this whole, I don't know if it's going to go to trial, whatever it, all this stuff takes for me to get my website back. But as long as that takes, yeah, everything's going to be free on Telegram for now. And then I'm honoring any subscriptions once I get everything back and running. Um, and we'll go from there. But anybody that wants to Telegram, you can just shoot me a message on social media. I'll send it to you. And I write up all my daily fantasy. player. Pro- I mean, there's just so much in there. Go check it out right now. Jeremy, appreciate you. Love you, buddy. Thanks for uh, lifting me up yesterday. That meant a lot to me. So we'll Absolutely, talk to man. you. Glad you had a great time. Thanks, pal. That's Jeremy Kahn with us here on GCR. When we come back in, we got to go three up and three down. Then we'll get a tidbit and two to wrap up. Stan the Fan, Luke Jackson, Ross Grimsley back in action later on this afternoon talking baseball, trying to make sense of the Orioles' offensive struggles. You can check that out, 5 o'clock, facebook.com slash pressboxsports. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill, great food, good sports. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates? A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money. I love you more every day. Well, then don't get a speeding ticket this trip, okay? Sign up for Rofo Rewards and upgrade to Rofo Pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. 
The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue to uh, wind down on the Monday edition of the program. Today's show is also brought to you by Goose Flights, which is available all over town. Pressboxonline.com slash Goose Flights to find out where delicious handcrafted lager in partnership with Guilford Hall Brewery. And at 198 from every can sold goes to benefit the Goose Flights Foundation and the work they're doing to provide non-emergency medical transport for those in need. Pressboxonline.com slash Goose Flights. Three up and three down. We need to do a, like an open for three up and three down. We should okay. work on that this All week. Right. Let's try All to right. do something baseball-y. You know, we can, we can figure something out. Three up and three down every Monday as long as there's not – if as. If there's a series that stretches into Monday, then we'll do it on a Tuesday, but otherwise we'll do it every Monday. Just looking back on the week that was in Orioles baseball, three players who are up for the week, three players who are down for the week. It's just not that hard. Um, we'll see. I didn't think it was – yeah, well, last week you somebody that you didn't include was stupid, but there were only three games last week. There was a bit more of a sample size this week to work with in six games. I didn't think it was very hard this week – um, but I I think there, there are more. I think there are more specific arguments that people can make. Like I made a specific argument. I think like some of last week's walk off heroes could be made as specific arguments. But I don't know that they had great weeks. I think they had good moments. You know what I mean? So we'll talk about all of it. You want to do? Do we do we do we, do we decide last week? Do we start with the positive or the negative? First? We start we with positive. With the positive last week. Yeah. My first up is Danny Coulomb. Okay. Or my, sorry, my number three up um, is Danny Coulomb. Uh, obviously, what he did on Saturday was magical. I mean, like, absolutely magical. So I was inclined to put him on the list just because of what he did on Saturday. I was like, I don't even remember what Danny Coulomb did the rest of the week. I think he was pretty good. But what he did on Saturday was so brilliant that, like, even if even if that was the only game he had pitched all week, I would be inclined to put him on the list because, my God, that was phenomenal. So let me go check. Three games, three innings, four strikeouts, no walks, no hits. Danny Coulomb, absolutely, I'm telling you, he would have been on my list no matter what. But I feel much more justified after going back and looking over the course of the last week. Danny Coulomb gets the number three spot on my three-up list. My number three, Danny Coulomb's a good one. Uh, my number three, I'm going with uh, Ryan Mountcastle this week. I think um, just, you know, for how poor the offense looked this week, um, Ryan Mountcastle has shown a lot of signs of life. He is hitting lefties extremely well. He's the only guy that I felt like was driving in runs really all week. He drove in, only drove in four runs, but that was the most of any Orioles hitters. Um, so I've been very, and he's been, and in the defense he's been playing at first base has also been very, very pleasantly surprising. I think his uh, his glove has looked really good. I think he's making a case to, I mean, at, with Ryan O'Hearn on the roster, I think it's gonna be hard to you know start him at first base against lefties. But I think uh, 
Mountie has looked really, really good uh, after, you know, really, I mean, he obviously has looked good since getting over the, the vertigo last year, um, and I think it's carrying over, and he's looking really good to start this season. So I've been impressed with Mount Castle, so I bring him in as, uh, as my number three as, you know, no one else was really sticking out too 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 much uh, uh, nobody, across the week. Uh, no offensive, no position player made my list. Really? I, okay. With, I, I, you are going to hate my list. I Yeah, I think I'm going to I can't imagine why you'd be putting position players on your list this week. Like, I I, I think Ryan Mount Castle's been better than some, but in the last week he's also struck out six times and is, like, I mean – He's been more productive than other guys, but that's because the bar is so insanely low from yeah. the last week that it's hard not to be more productive than other guys. Um, it, I would I would have thought about him. There's no world like I when I say I don't I don't think you could have a bad list. I Ryan Mountcastle did not have a better week than Danny Coulomb did, but I, I can't wait to see if that if I if you've got more. I God I can't imagine what I'm going to end up saying at that point. Yeah, I can't wait either. Um. I, again, I at some point we just might have to change the segment. Um. Number two is Grayson Rodriguez, who delivered another outstanding start on uh, Friday, and was not quite as good as the guy that ends up being number one on the list for the week. But Grayson Rodriguez, two starts in, like every ounce of what you think Grayson Rodriguez is capable of becoming, um, happens to be the team is one is two starts, but the one doesn't count. That was from the previous week. Only can look at one from this week. Grayson Rodriguez was great. I had to include Jordan Westberg on my list. You certainly did not have to. I thought I did. I thought it was, I. I've been very. I've really enjoyed watching Jordan Westberg play play baseball. He can play multiple positions. He plays all of them well. And obviously, he got the week started with the walk off on Monday night, which I which was just a, an incredible moment. Um, after you know that just those, all three of those games were just miserable with the with the rain and the cold and uh, and Westbrook hitting a walk off to to get the thing started on Monday night I thought was was in, incredible and uh, I I think Westbrook should be in the lineup every single day I think to your point he should be the everyday third baseman he's hitting 182 this week and he hit a walk off that I, w- that by the way him. the only argument I could see for you having him like number three on your list is that he did have a walk off like he did he didn't have a good week but he did have a big moment. Um, we we gotta we gotta start. Do you know where like to find the numbers for the week? Yeah, like, I do. Yeah. Do we just not look at them? Okay. Like, I mean, I I mean, we we're talking about moments of the week, performance I, of the week, I, and I, he was the player of the game on he Monday did, night. He did he have a, a moment. Big home yes, run. He I, had a moment, and the Orioles went. Nobody else was good during the week, the week. I could see that he being was the responsible case. for one of those wins. I, the pitching was very good last week. I I I don't know what to say. Like the pitching was exceptional last week. I mean, not everybody, but for the most part. Um, I, this is weird. This is a weird, weird bit. Obviously, Dean Kramer was the player of the week. That's, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say at this point. Um, and that's really encouraging, right? Because the start that Dean Kramer got off to in his first start against Kansas City. Now, this is also a little bit unfair because he's the guy that has the advantage of having gotten two starts during the course of the week. So he's able to like sort of stockpile more to work with. But they were both good starts. Um, Dean Kramer had a very good week. Yesterday, he was outstanding. I mean, he was just simply excellent yesterday. Um, The game against Kansas City, again, he struggled early, but battled through it to end up delivering a good start. I'm not going to go beyond that. It wasn't a quality start because he didn't go six innings. Um, But he allowed four base runners and five and a third. That's a whip that you'd like. Um three earned runs, like everything about that gave them the opportunity to win the game. And then when you combine that with an excellent start yesterday, I mean, it just didn't allow an earned run. Dean Kramer was the player of the week, and it kind of wasn't close. Um, can, I re- can I redo my list? I, I would think about it. I'm going to, unfortunately for Mountcastle, I think I'm going to knock him off the list. I- <laughs> I'm still going to stick with my number one, who I, who I was originally sticking with. It's Grayson is going to be my number one. I would throw in Dean as my number two. Westberg <laughs> is my number three. It's a better. That's a way better it's list. It's a way better list. It's a way I overlooked better. Kramer list. start yesterday uh, way too much, um, just because they ended up losing the game, and you know, just like just not like, because just of Dean like, Kramer, just like across all sports, results matter. Yeah, fine. And they didn't win the game. Not, and, and that, so that, this is absurd. <laughs> like, I mean, this uh, is 
This is the the bad bit that you Grayson, do with Lamar Jackson. Grayson, uh, just because of him pitching into the seventh inning uh, on the Pirates' opening day did, and did going. Dean Kramer into, pitched seven innings yesterday. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but what are we I doing? See Dean, Dean do it more, and Grayson what? is proving that he, you know, is going to be an ace in this league. And uh, I was a very, I really enjoyed watching Grayson on uh, on Friday on on Friday. I love Grayson in the win it, over it, the Pirates. It's 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 a win over the Pirates. It's and it's wrong, but like I I can at least like understand that. I just think Grayson Rodriguez is so good, and I get so excited by him that I'm going to put him at number one, even though I know he's not. The, like I can understand all of that, right? Not having Dean Kramer on your list. He's on my number two. Only after I said something. Yeah, yeah, well, because I overlooked Dean too much. That's a prop. All right, well. We're trying to make lists. Getting better. we got to get a lot better. we got to get a lot All better. All right, well, we'll just react to your list. Next no, week. I don't want that to be the case. I want to have a conversation. I just don't want it to be absurd. Um, Look, man, I'm excited about Grayson, too. But, like, again, you're, you're failing. Like, the arguments are not being made well for why in the in the quantification. And, I, of, and it's hard to look at. Uh, it's always hard to, I guess, measure pitching. And, you know, we look at in it. In smaller uh, sample sizes? Yes, I'll in, listen to in that. In smaller sample sizes. And it's the fact that, you know, when paying a pitcher, this guy's going to only pitch every fifth day or a reliever is only going right. to pitch every three and days. And, by the way, it, there's not – there's going to – And most, you see these offensive guys most, every single day. Most weeks, those offensive guys are going to be in better shape. None of them hit this week. Mm-hmm. It was a dreadful week for the offense. It was, and maybe that's awful. why to me it did. It felt like Mountcastle and and Westberg stuck out as in the way Westberg was able to manufacture runs in was it Saturday against Pittsburgh and yeah, just working okay. his way around the bases and scoring. Okay, <laughs> I I like Westberg a lot. I like Westberg too, but I can't pretend like something is something that it wasn't. You know what I mean? Like I can't, I can't do that. Top um, three player this week for me. Danny Coulomb did essentially what Jordan Westberg did. Like, Danny Coulomb, in fact, I would say it's more impressive what Danny Coulomb did in one game yeah. and also pitched well in his other appearances. And it's going to be Jordan really Jordan Westberg hard. It's had be... a cool moment and and was meh the rest uh-huh. of the week. I'll have, to, I'll have to see, like, you know, how I want to measure performances in losses. Like, like it is yeah, it's I, difficult to... Like, if somebody caught... Like, here's, I'll give you, here's something I'll give you in measuring somebody. If Gunnar Henderson otherwise had a, a good a good week, not a you know a great week, mm-hmm. if he had a great week and threw the ball away one time, that's not going to change something. But if he had a good week, then him throwing the ball away and costing a game might be what makes me say, well, he can't be on the list. You know what I mean? Like I can't put him on the list because that's too negative. I don't. Whatever the result is, does not change the fact that with the game on the line and the bases loaded and nobody out, Danny Coulomb came in and performed magic magic that was breathtaking what Danny Coulomb did on Saturday it's just that unfortunately after that the team let him down but it ain't about him what he did it's a bummer that they lost the game because if they didn't we might be talking about that in July and maybe so maybe uh, as we transition to the other list maybe my hider should be on my list for the fact that uh, can, uh maybe that, that Coulomb that wasn't the maybe, first pitcher they brought maybe in maybe that, that should be the case yeah. maybe that should be the case cuz then there would be no question that, ironic yeah. that you should bring that up all right those are our 3 up for the week now to our 3 down for the week and we begin on my 3 down with Mike Bauman now I'm not Mike. Mike Bauman basically gets to give reprieve to a lot of other hitters that could be in the like the top two. Obviously, on my list of three down, were very easy for me. the The third, I think, there were a lot of choices as to who could have been the third down this week. I went with Bauman, and I went with Bauman because of that spot. Now, we could discuss, to your point, why it was that Mike Bauman was the guy that was put into that spot. I don't know. We, I don't. I think you and I talked about it when we were together on Saturday night. I don't remember. What, there was an extra inning game last year where Mike Bauman came in and had a, a magical escape himself, and I can't remember what the game was or the circumstances. I, and I don't know enough about what the matchups were with the hitters that were due up for, for any of that. Like, there could very well be quite logical reasons why Mike Bauman was the choice in that spot. Yeesh. Yeesh. And add to it um, that for the whole, for his week, his ERA was nine because that was the only thing he pitched in the entire week. And he gave up a couple of hits and he gave up 
the tying run. Brutal. Brutal. In a game that, for as poorly as they played, the Orioles had a chance to win and stockpile the series. Mike Bauman is the choice for me at number three. I was in, yeah, just because it was his only appearance of the week. I I was torn between Bauman and uh, and Tony Kemp as my number three, and I think it's you know I, I almost nothing, don't even want to judge Tony, Tony Kemp. Kemp. I know exactly. Like, it's nothing Tony Kemp's done, but it's like you know it's he had four at bats all week. He went over four. Like why 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 is he here? And uh, it's just it's just baffling. And then so Tony Kemp is kind of my number three. It's gonna for, feel for weird. That reason, it's almost like it's hard it's, to. I have no expectations for Tony Kemp, so it's hard for him to disappoint me. Yeah, like, yeah. He's. He's not really an Oriole, so like he can't really let well, me down. Well, the disappointment down. is just every time I remembered that, I that understand. he's on the roster. I understand. It's... I understand the thought process. Um, my number two is Cedric Mullins. I don't want to belabor it. Everybody loves Cedric Mullins. It ain't good. It ain't good. Now, I, it's it's nine games. I'm not. I'm not going to allow myself to, to get crazy about it. But we can't pretend like it's not happening either. At some point, it's going to matter. Cedric Mullins is my number two. I went with uh, I went with uh, Cole Irvin as my number two here. Certainly wasn't good. Um, but yeah, he had, uh, only had one Cedric, start. He Cedric will through. probably appreciate the reprieve. <laughs> he did get through five innings, um, but you know that he took the loss in the Kansas City game. Had four runs. He gave up seven hits. I think yeah, he was, walked a couple guys. It was, like it, was, it, was yeah, it was not good. It was so bad. Cole I, Irvin. I don't have I don't have beef with two. like that. That's a good. I don't. You know, it wasn't my guy, but I can say Cole Irvin was bad. I understand Cole Irvin being on your list. I certainly get it. Um, look, man, the Quad City DJs feel like they've had a hit more recently than Austin Hayes. Like, it's, you know, it sucks. I hate it. I like Austin Hayes, but he had a wretched week. Just a wretched, unproductive, brutal, brutal week. Just yeah, easy I think what they say he was sick on one of the days this week too, and that was why he wasn't in the lineup one of the days. So hopefully, I you know he's feeling better. But, but yeah, this goes to like, like I, I, but over fifteen. It's, it's a rem- it's a reminder though. We were ready to have the Orioles DFA Ryan Mountcastle at one point last season. We 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 constantly have to remember now. The vertigo seems like that was a bigger part of the story last last year. But sometimes there isn't even a vertigo. It's just a something's going on that you don't know about that's going on and it it's a bad week it's a bad couple of weeks it's a bad month whatever it is these things happen at some point it will matter there will come a point this season where it will matter and it, i don't know if maybe it got close last year with Ryan Mountcastle to the point where it might have mattered you know i don't know or maybe they knew all along that the vertigo i i still look back at the timeline and i'm like right they were still putting him out there mm-hmm. like when so it's tough for me to figure it out. But we baseball it we we because there are so many games, the statistics get they pile up. And we see bigger sample sizes and we're like, dude, this is nine games, this is twelve games, this is fifteen games. And then we forget in context that's a third of the season. Not even at this point, obviously. We're talking about it being, you know, a seventeenth, a sixteenth of the season, something like that. Um like, it, context does matter here. We're frustrated, but by June, Austin Hayes might look like an all-star again. He'll have, you know, three outfield assists. And, yeah. yeah. Like, I, we just got to we gotta be careful about these things in the conversation about the guys at Norfolk because I'm not ready to say that Austin Hayes is a problem yet. Mm-hmm. He's just he's a he guy, just had a really bad week. He's a guy who had a really bad week and was an easy choice for number one on three down this week. All right, we'll get those up at glennclarkradio.com here in a little bit. Um, three Up, Three Down was also brought to you by Pressbox and the Pressbox print issue. This is like the final week that this print issue is available for it will make way for a new print issue. And as Stan the Fan told you, Gr- uh, Griffin's number one will be on the cover of the next print issue. Grayson Rodriguez will be uh, the feature cover story for the next it was, print it was, issue. It was a promo the whole time. That's what it was. Go get this right now at your neighborhood Royal Farms and at the hundreds of locations around town where you find press box. All right. Tidbit is brought to you today by County Sports Zone, countysports.zone, which is proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer and buyatoyota.com. Everything you need to know for boys and girls lacrosse, baseball, and softball this spring, scores, schedules, rankings, play pick them. It's all there, countysports.zone, brought to you by buyatoyota.com and your local Toyota dealer. Oh, we don't need to do tidbit really because we uh, yeah, I guess not. Basically, and it's twelve twenty-four, so 
Okay. How how pressing? Uh, all right. It's uh, all right. So Tessa Johnson of South Carolina uh-huh. led the team in scoring. She was ranked ninth on the team in total points uh, during the entirety of the season. Never before in a men or women's tournament championship, uh, or sorry, yeah, the tour- in the tournament championship, uh, had a player finished lower than sixth on the team in scoring and then led the team in the final in their tournament clinching win in scoring. Hmm. That's interesting. So she was ninth on the team. There were other players. Uh, there were three other players that have that led or co-led their teams in scoring in the title game while finishing sixth on their respective teams. One of them, and you're not going to be able to guess them, but uh, 1990 with the Stanford women, Sonia Henning led uh, the team in scoring. Okay. Led, led the I, team I do know who that is. So I got that going for me. 96 uh, was Tiffany Johnson leading the Tennessee, Tennessee women in scoring in their, t- in their uh, championship okay. game. And then in 2016 for the Villanova men. Uh... Chris Jenkins, Phil Booth, Phil led the oh team. Baltimore's own. yeah, yeah Phil Booth led the team in scoring. He did uh, have a, he did have a hell of a game that night. He yes. did have a hell of a game. Yes, so I wanted to include that one. I think Phil Booth might still hold the record for the most career NCAA tournament wins, although the pandemic might have effed oh. that up. I wonder if somebody surpassed when he when his career ended. He had won more NCAA tournament games than any player, despite the fact they got knocked out early the one year. Mm-hmm. Um, he had won the most NCAA tournament games of any player. I don't know if that's something that changed because of the pandemic and somebody getting to play in a fifth tournament and that screwing things up. But I'd like to know that if you can co- if you can pull yeah, that. Yeah, see if I can pull it up quickly or have it. We'll ready move tomorrow. on. We'll do we'll do tubular. We, everything else can hold for tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Or or wasn't important enough that we. Yeah, not it. important okay. enough. Very good. Tubular is brought to you by. Ooh, it's brought to you by Atmans Deli in Harbor Point. We're so excited about the new Atmans. I got to get back down there. Maybe this weekend when the baseball team's back home, we can get down to Harbor Point to check out the new Atmans. Everything you love about the original Atmans plus now includes a full bar atmansdeli.com to see the daily specials at the new Atmans Deli in Harbor Point. Here's what's coming up totally tubular wise. It is not much on the sports front because like basically everybody bails because of the cha- the NBA still doesn't play. I'm stunned that the NBA never got to a point where they were like Dude, we're just going to play. We're the NBA. You know what I mean? Um, but no NBA games tonight. Obviously, the championship game. I mean, they game, could play games at like 6. Uh, and be finished. At 100%. 10 they could play a game at 6.30 and still be finished yeah. before 9.20 when the uh, title game tips off. I think it's because they want to give the play. Like, if your alma mater is in the game, uh, okay. they want to give you the chance I mean, to yeah, go to the game. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Like them uh, yeah, and, like, off. one night is not the end of the world, but, like, I think for betters, it's like, dude, we have slim right. pickings tonight. And, like, it's not a full baseball slate, so. But, I mean, I guess maybe that would be the reason to change it moving forward, just because betting, betting yeah. is. TBS for the title game, Purdue and UConn at 920. Masson uh, Nationals Giants at 945. That's also on MLB Network in the rest of the country. MLB Network, uh, for everybody, Mets Braves at 7 o'clock, and then locally, Rays Angels at 10. Orioles legend starting for the Mets today, Julio Terran. Oh, Terran. gets his first Mets start. Yeah. How about that? You, can't, you cannot miss that. Get to Sports and Social early. Yeah. I will not be there at 7 o'clock. I'm going to attempt to play like a half a trivia tonight and then okay. go to Sports and Social. Like, that's the – I keep thinking about it. It's, it's after 9 – it's so late. It's so late. But uh, come join me tonight at Sports and Social for the title game. We'll have great giveaways, another pair of baseball tickets to give away, uh, some gift cards, stuff like that. It's going to be a fun night at Sports and Social. Come hang out with us tonight. And USA for all the fallout from WrestleMania on WWE Monday Night Raw tonight at 8 as well. Non-sports? Uh, not a whole lot. A new episode of All-American on CW. Um, new episode of The Sin and Non-Fix. I think I forgot to mention this, but it's on HBO. It's another... You could probably make this a book clubber. It's another cult. They're, I guess they're doing cult documentaries now. Like those are That's the thing right now. But it's about uh, Sin and Non. Have you ever heard of Sin and Non? I don't know how... Chuck no, Dietrich, doesn't. he did like a drug rehab thing and brought in, I guess, people that were, you know, addicted to drugs and uh, essentially turned them into, you know, joining his cult. Uh, so... That is on HBO at nine tonight, and then uh, Henry uh, Henry Cable will be on Jimmy uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Is there a new Superman coming out? Or uh, I wish it is the Ministry. Well, this one should be good too, but the Ministry of the en- of Ungentlemanly Warfare comes out next Friday. Yeah, next Friday. The Guy Ritchie movie. Alan Richardson. Oh, in it. oh, and now that's all you needed to say. Yeah. Uh, and they're like beating up Nazis and stuff in World War Two. Sounds great. Yeah. You haven't seen uh, previews for this? No, time? I don't know how I've missed this. Uh, but yeah, it looks uh, it looks like it should be decent. I can't wait. Remind me about it next week. Okay. Wait, is it in theaters? It is in theaters. Well, not, remind me about it when you can watch it somewhere that's not a movie theater. No chance that's Sometime over the summer. Right. 
All right, very good. Thanks today to Dan Bonner. Thanks to John Mioli, Jeremy Kahn. We'll get it up in the greatest hits section of the... Oh, my God, it's so good. ...tab at glennclarkradio.com. Uh, tomorrow, of course, Patrick Stevens will recap the title game and the weekend in lacrosse. Uh, probably talk about John Calipari a little bit as well. Um, uh, of course, County Sports on Radio with Wes Brown. Uh, preview the Red Sox tomorrow. Do yes, we, okay, we'll, we'll preview the Red Sox yeah. tomorrow. That's all we can say. And Stuff in the oh, I thought we're we not doing uh, the, the Sam Dykstra. Is that oh, right? oh, uh, yeah, I th- uh, yeah, we should be able to. Yes. Right, okay. Stuff and things. Very good. Thanks everybody. Likely. Press box. All of our great sponsors and partners, including Roots Chris, Live Casino and Hotel, Atman's Deli, AJ Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms. Costas in Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Monday evening. I, I, go, I like Cam Spencer. Go Cam Spencer. Okay. I mean, I just I feel I'm happy I have for a bet him. On, I, have a, I have a future on Purdue. That's not my concern. Duke sucks. <laughs>